<laughs> uh, mute hey, your, we're mute your phone. Are we live? Mute yeah. your phone. Mute your computer. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. I'm here today with Father Andrew Dalton, who is an expert on the Shroud of Turin. And um, I'm really pumped to learn about this because it was awesome to meet you several weeks ago in Rome and to have you give me and the Batuzinator, uh, Cameron Batuzzi, um, a tour. I was really blown away. So I'm so pumped about this episode. Yeah, there's everything in that exhibit. I could almost, I wish we could like transport ourselves there. Um, but I think it's going to be cool also just to chat it out and have a conversation. Yeah. There's lots of stuff on the shroud already online, but I think a conversation allows to kind of tease out some things that maybe people watching will also want to ask about. So hope yeah. that works. Um, for those who aren't aware of you, who are you? Um, oh yeah. I'd love to know about you know, <laughs> your, your expertise in this and how long you've been studying it. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Father Andrew Dalton and I'm an American priest that's living in Rome. I teach at a pontifical university. And one of the things that I teach is uh, shroud studies, specifically the biblical theology of the passion of Christ according to the shroud of Turin. So it's kind of like the pastoral and spiritual, of, but also the theology, the theology that accompanies the sufferings of Christ as we know them uh, by the shroud of Turin. So we can unpack that more, but... Um, I was there in Rome studying philosophy and theology and bumped into the shroud. I really didn't think that I would specialize in this. Um, my background was in engineering though. Like my strong subjects in school when I was a kid were maths and sciences. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of derailed all that to join the priesthood when I was 20 years old. And um, yeah, collided with this shroud expert who had written dozens of books on the shroud, spent over 30 years studying it. Who and is she, she, her name is Emanuela Marinelli. And um, she came to our university and this priest friend of mine said, you have to hear her speak. And I said, look, I got places to go, things to do. I'm, I'll sit in for a little bit, but I'll probably have to sneak out uh, after a few minutes. And <laughs> I was glued to my chair. She was absolutely riveting. I, I quite literally lost sleep that night. I was so excited to hear about the shroud. I was like, how in the world am I 10 years a seminarian and I've never heard this stuff? Like wow. the world needs to know it. And um, so I stayed long, I think like three hours with Emanuela. Um, we've since become friends and have appeared on, on television together, et cetera. We're, we're quite close. This is now like 11 years later, probably, because um, that was the first generation of the postgraduate certificate in Shroud. Do you know you could study the Shroud for a year um, in a pontifical university? Wow. People don't know how much there is out there, but this is the most studied archaeological object in the history of the world. Say that again for people. The most studied archaeological object in the history of the world. And so when it comes to historical uh, events, like the, what you're looking for is monumentum et documentum, right? That you have a monument and a document. And of course, we're all familiar that there are documents telling about Jesus's passion, but many people don't know um, about the shroud at least to the degree that one can know. And so here's what happened with Emanuela. I stayed, I stayed talking with her. She said, wait till you come back next week because there's a physicist who is, he'll be speaking. Yeah, if you lost sleep last night, <laughs> Yes, <buckle> exactly. <laughs> and he was just that way. His name is, uh, is Paolo, Paolo Di Lazzaro. He spent five years, this guy, just trying to reproduce by ultraviolet light That's amazing. On, on a linen, just playing with the variables of light, you know, amplitude, frequency, duration yep. of exposure so that he could recreate um, an image like that of the man of the shroud on another linen. Mm -hmm. And this guy w made himself famous when he published an article saying that the amount of energy you would need to recreate a similar image would be 34,000 billion watts. And of course, you, you, you've probably bumped into this on the internet now. But what it, does that look like? Well, it's not a matter of what it looks like so much as, I mean, what, what it looks would that like. do? Well, here's the trouble. <laughs> you see, this is why it took five years, right? Because he took diff these different variables of light trying to reproduce something caramel colored mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a linen. Yeah. But it was frustrating because he got either nothing or just charred the linen altogether. Yeah. Which obviously we don't have. I yeah. really want to get into that, yeah. but I know we want to go into that in depth. So let's, can we just start really Back basically? Up. So when did you actually first see the shroud? After, mm -hmm. Was it after you heard this lecture? Yeah, so. And then tell people what the shroud is. Give them the basic definition for those who are like, I think I know what it is, but. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there. We'll go slow. Sure. So I first bumped into this exhibit. I, I say the shroud 
talk by Marinelli. I want to say that was 2000 and oh gosh, is it 11? The first year that we started. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think back to that. But I I w- I lost sleep. I told you and met these these different experts. They were wanting to explain what the what the shroud is, who the man of the shroud is, and what significance it had. All part of a pontifical university's program to like give you a panoramic view of shroud study. So interdisciplinary. But the basic premise is that we'd been reverencing this cloth down through the ages as the burial shroud that wrapped the body of Jesus. So again, Jesus, of course, is on the cross on, on Good Friday, but he's taken down and then laid in the tomb. Well, when he's laid in the tomb, he's wrapped in these clothes. We should spend some time in that passage of mm-hmm. John where it's written about. Yeah, we'll but, get there. But before, just to kind of lay it all out, the, 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 the church proposes to have exactly that. At least that's what's on display in Turin that is four and a half hours north of Rome by, by the fast train. You can go and see this relic, which is on display in the cathedral there. And that's to say it's inside of a case and only on special occasions do they take it's out of a double case, like in inert gas and constant temperature and pressure, n- never exposed to more than 50 lux of light. We want to preserve this thing for future generations. Now, so I started to meet the, those guys, the 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 authorities, the ecclesial authorities in in uh, Turin, a few years later. So now I'm on Othonia as part of this non for profit, this international group for shroud study, and so I go there um, regularly. We just had a meeting a few weeks ago, um, but they have a shroud museum. They have an international study of shroud studies, and they provide many of the experts that teach at our pontifical university. So at the one hand, you had this like hub of of study, like the minds that were involved in, mm-hmm. in probing this document to understand its mysteries. And the other side, you had these, these museums that would kind of showcase or create a space of experience with the shroud. Mm. Those are two different kind of questions, right? Some people just know the image mm-hmm. and they, that they dive into prayer and contemplation through that. And that's one way uh, to experience the shroud for sure. But another is to like roll up your sleeves, get, get the experts on scene to study the physics, the chemistry, the biology, the forensic medicine, and then the history, the art history. There are, like I say, so many different. Um, so lead me where you want to no, lead No, that's me. good. And we're going to get into all the objections to why the shroud may not be authentic. But when do we first have evidence in literature of the existence of the shroud? Yeah, if you want to follow the paper trail back, um, backwards. Paper or even icon trail. There might be it, images of it. Right. So you're going to get different answers depending okay. on what database you're looking at. But so many people point to the year 1354 because that was when it was on display in the hands of a certain Geoffroy de Charny in France, in Lire. And he, and this we have his stamp, we have his seal, family crest. Um, nobody doubts that in 1354, what he was looking at and what was on display is the shroud, as we call it today, the Shroud of Turin. Prior to that, there's evidence, but it is controverted evidence. Like you say, it'll be things like icons. So a a typical one is the Mount Sinai Pantocrator in uh, St. Catherine's. And there- Could we throw up the image of the shroud just so people can kind of see what we're talking about? Yeah, in fact, I should I should describe what you're looking at there because it's not immediately obvious. Which t- one is that? Yeah, so let's look at um, f- first do slide six, okay? And I think at the the top of the the picture you'll see uh, a kind of tan or beige picture. Would you be able to? Oh yeah, tilt sure. That a little? And we'll zoom in on some of the that's particulars perfect. here. Thank you. That's more than perfect. You don't have to give okay. me that much. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, so. At the top, you see, th- this is a really long cloth. It's hard to see perhaps in our computer screen how wide this is, but this is 14 feet. So 13 foot, seven inches to be exact. And then three foot seven is is its height. So that's like 4.4 meters by 1.1 meters. And what you see on the left side of the, of the linen is mm-hmm. the frontal image of the body. Right. And then on the right side is the dorsal image of the body. So it actually wrapped all the way around. In fact, there's another picture that I've got in here. Let me pull it up. So it just, this will explain very easily. Here we go. Go to um, slide 13. This, um, this is just a painting 
but it shows this angel holding up in the clouds, the, mm-hmm. the linen. And just below the, the shroud is at the foot of the cross, you have Jesus um, wrapped in, in right. this cloth. It's simply to depict, it's kind of a didactic photo so you can understand how he was lying both on top of the body mm-hmm. and then it, there, it's so long that it wraps around the back yeah. of his head, over his face and over his stomach. <coughs> so now when you unfold it, you get um, what is in the, the hands of the angel there. When but was that painting produced? This is much later. I want to say it's the 16th or maybe 17th century. Okay. But it's simply a, a good way of um, mm-hmm. visually yeah. understanding that it's only the inside of the cloth. Many people don't know this, that the shroud is colorized. It's imaged on only one side of the cloth. So it's the side that touches his body. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's so superficial that if you were to just gently graze with a a razor blade, you would, you would erase the image of the man forever. I, this is what Paolo de Lazzaro discovered. If I can just dive a little detail, because this is so interesting. Um, if you ask the question, like what's the depth of penetration of coloration on the surface of the shroud, the answer is mind boggling. It's 200 to 500 nanometers which is, uh, that's not even a number that I can fathom. So I, I, I give this example of a human hair. Like take a single human hair. Imagine you could very carefully with your scissors um, cut it in half along yeah. its long end and discard that half. And now with what remains, try to cut it in half again. Do that four or five times until you're left with one sixteenth or one twentieth of the width of, uh, of a human hair. That's the that's the depth of penetration. And so as you say, that is on one side of the shroud, but, but not, not on the, the other. other. In so fact, if you were using some instrument to paint or imprint this image, you would likely see it on the other side. That's right. There's nothing soaked into the fibers. In fact, that was one of the main questions. That was one of the main theories on the table when this gets tested. I'm sure we'll get into those testings in a moment. But one of the theories was that this was a painting. And so this was pigment, either organic or inorganic. Maybe it's a dye. Maybe it's a, um, an ink of some sort. And so they, they had made a list of the chemical properties of all of the pigments known to man throughout history. <laughs> and they do a certain test called paralysis mass spectroscopy that would not only find it, but identify its chemical composition. While well, sweeping the whole shroud, you don't find any of that, not a single dose of little dot or drop of, of pigment, organic or inorganic, no varnish, no dye, no directionality whatsoever with which some liquid is applied to the cloth. And again, it doesn't soak into the fibers. It's like the blood stains do. You can see them on the That's other fascinating. side. A great experiment is to just take transmitted light, like a regular light bulb, mm-hmm. walk to the other side of the shroud, and you'll see the blood stains because now they'll be backlit. Yes. And you'll see them all the more. But guess what you won't see? The image of the man. The body image of the man. It just disappears. It's so superficial and so frail wow. that it's overpowered by just simple light on the other side. And so this is what we're unable to produce today, even artificially, even after all this study, even of the 2023 now, we don't have a micro laser capable of delivering a micro burn this precise. And so the obvious question is how in the world did this come into being? Like what's the genesis of this enigmatic image? Before we get get further, I know that people are going to come in with these thoughts of wasn't this disproved? So it might be helpful to show why that isn't the case before we go on to kind of um, assuage people's. Right. Let's do that. Okay. So slide three here shows some pictures. This is probably what you saw on front page news um, in 1988. Look at that. Of Dr. Michael Tyson. Can you see the uh, the 1260-1390? exclamation yeah. part that's the exclamation part that really this is just <laughs> it, it just screams academic excellence and uh propriety doesn't it yes. um th- these same guys with this uh very um composed stance with their arms folded before these like yeah. powered pillars um yeah it just says th- these these same guys got uh, what's the number i'm gonna forget like how many million in sterling they got for their new museum like the next day it's a matter of the public record the moment this was published they were able to build their new laboratory. Some stuff was very fishy from the start, but it's just it's just the case that across the world, front page news everywhere was the Turin Shroud was it's been proven to be a medieval fake. It tells us nothing, therefore, about Jesus' sufferings. It can't be considered a relic, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you still believed that the Shroud was real after this point, you might as well believe that the earth is flat. It was You're about the same category. And I, my heart just goes out for those people who are serious students of the, the ones who had dedicated hundreds of thousands of hours. Um, 
especially the, the team from STIRP in 1978, these guys had published already t over 20 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles. They knew from the start to be suspicious of this. Really? But what I like, and this, I, I would lead with this now, is that as of 2017, um, we've, we have a published article that shows that the conclusions from 1988 are no longer sustainable. So I should say that again, the very publication, Archaeometry right. out of Oxford, they, that first- That published this. That published that, this 1260 it. to 13, it said, wow. that conclusion can no longer be sustained. And so- And I'm sure that hit the front pages all around oh, the world too, yeah, right? Right, not, no, exactly. <laughs> so although it is a matter of mainstream science. So if you want to find in the literature, you're gonna bump into this. The, the French researcher who published this article is Tristan Casabianca, another friend of ours who teaches at our, our university. And he, he, he goes into all the details. It's, it's a fascinating story. But I wanna say it was in 2017 that according to the Freedom of Information Act, these laboratories were compelled by law to release the raw data that shows how heterogeneous were their individual um, results. Because there was Oxford, Zurich, and um, Zurich, Oxford, and Arizona. Those were the three laboratories. And the idea was that they were gonna publish independently um, and that their particular results, but that didn't happen. They, they lumped them together and mm. gave us this big arc, 1260 to 1390, 95% sure that this is the time period from which the, the shroud hails, and so it's fake. Um, but the bottom line is that they use a sample from the top left corner of the shroud, which we know to be uh, anomalous. It's, it's just not representative of the rest of the shroud. And we knew that, and we had proof of that 10 years prior. You would think somebody would have the sense. Do you sense. think they knew that? Well, they ought to have known, that much we know. We, we knew though this, that in the moment that they're cutting the sample, eight centimeters of the most prized relic in all of Christendom. And of course, you know that with carbon dating, you, you carbonize, that is you destroy, you put into a fire, basically, this cloth never to be seen again. And so you'd think you'd be very careful. Like compare that to the STIRP team, the Shroud of Turn Research Project of 1978. For a whole year, they prepare just so all of their tests will be non-invasive, non-destructive. And yet here, we're about to destroy forever eight centimeters mm. and they don't know where they're gonna take the sample two hours prior to the experiment. And it's all on videotape. In, in Italy, there was a documentary that came out just telling this whole fiasco and it's called La Notte della Sindone. It's the night of the shroud. And you know who does the narrating, if I'm not mistaken, is the, uh, the same actress. I'm going to forget her name now, who mm. plays the devil in The Passion of the Christ. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's got some, it's got some fun oh, imagery man. there. It's a little... A little yeah, on the nose. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. It's a little edgy. <clears throat> but the fact is, I, I can understand why some people were upset. But here's the thing. Even if you think that those uh, laboratories did good science, and I'm willing to you know, be benevolent and, and, and say as much, even if they did perfect science... Um, they did so on a sample that tells us literally nothing about the rest of the shroud. Like you could look at the chemical composition, like you can see a map, what's called a brightness map of, from the UV fluorescence, like turn off the, the lights, shine UV, capture what fluoresces, and it tells you about the chemical composition of the cloth. It's all uniform. It's all like orange hues, mm. maybe a little yellow, a little red, mm -hmm. but it's not forest green, but that's exactly what color it is in that top left corner. Like a little kid in kindergarten can point to that and say, look, mom, that part is different. And yet this is where these, you know, world renowned scientists are using to date the shroud. It's just So why not take another piece of the shroud and carbon date that? Wouldn't that be enough to prove what you want to prove? Yes, except that you can imagine that after this very embarrassing episode, many people are hesitant to go that way. I think the church would, be, remember, it's the, it's the church that's paying for this. Cardinal Ratzinger at the time was saying, yeah, these are your protocols, absolutely. Let's do seven samples, seven laboratories. About how much does that cost? Yeah, I have no idea. That I didn't see, but um, and sadly, that got reduced to first three samples and then one, and then they published together against their own protocols. Were so. these fellows alive when it got retracted? That I don't know, because yeah, here we are 30 years later. So 2017, yeah, it's like- Oh, that's when four, tw that the same when publishing the outfit retracted it. Yeah, I, I may even be 2019 by the time that okay, gets published. 2017, wow. I think, is when the first research is done. And then um, um, 
but it's worth looking up uh, even on the internet you can find or in shroud.com that's like the mecca of all scientific data what's it called the uh, shroud shroud no just shroud.com thursday yeah so that's led by barry schwartz who is um the teacher so right after i was telling you i met emanuela yeah. then paolo and then barry barry schwartz he's got a a light, um, a white ponytail. Have you seen this guy? A big no. white beard. No. He's super fun. He's Jewish, okay. and so he was my buddy. Like when he we came, he came to Rome, and he gave an extended um, course on shroud studies because he was up close and personal with the cloth in 1970 as technical photographer. You have to realize that the this is all the people that came together from the highest powered laboratories across America when they discover that the shroud encodes 3D information. So in, a different, in addition to the fact that the, the man's body is anatomically perfect, that it acts as a photo negative, we'll put a little bookmark on that, and then when it encodes 3D information, this is what's going to mobilize these, uh, these laboratories across the states to then petition the royal family in the Savoy in Turin to study hands-on the shroud for five days, hmm. 120 consecutive hours. What did that look like? And well... Here's a picture. So if you want to see when they bring um, 80 crates of the most state-of-the-art material overseas to, to study, they just want to answer one question, which is... To what, what number is that for him? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is, what does that say? 11? 11. 11. So this is the team um, on the top left Thursday? corner. Yeah. Um, this is uh, John Jackson here looking at the shroud, which is mounted on this like stainless steel. Like they brought overseas so that everything it was by magnets so as not to like prick or um like destroy in any way everything mm. was to be non-invasive they almost create a international scandal when they can't get through customs with all this <gasps> state-of-the-art ma material but they uh, the question isn't religious at this point it's yeah. really important to highlight that it's simply you've got catholics and protestants and atheists jews. and uh, jews and agnostics and everything else under the sun and their only question is to answer by what mechanism, by what means was this image produced? Because yeah. we've never seen anything like it. And to this day, we've never been able to reproduce anything like it, especially at the microscopic level. Um, so that really does invite the question, right? If it's not a painting, if it's not a scorch, if it's not a rubbing, if it's not a camera oscura, right? Some sort of medieval photography. Well, then what in the heck is it? Wow. And, and their so this is something, sorry. Sorry, just to, yeah, to tell you what they came home with is more questions than answers. Wow. Because they don't tell you what it is. They tell you what it's not. They say, it's not human artwork. It's not, it's not mm. made by- It's um, like via negativa. Exactly. It's, uh, they, they, they leave open this question of how it's made. And so mm. that really does leave room for the theory that many, of course, Christians have proposed is that what if it's the natural effect of a supernatural event? What if it's after the resurrection or in the moment of the resurrection, whatever that looks like, that produced this image? Um, so some things, even from a scientific or empirical point of view, point in that direction. So for example, um, the, the blood stains compared to the body image. So here's, here's a question that I, I like to ask is like, if you are a con artist, if you're a forger, if you're, if you're trying to present to the world an image that you made, but make it look real, what would you do? Would you, would you paint the body first and then paint the blood stains? Or would you first start with the blood stains and then after the fact, no, probably add the, first, the body? Probably the first way. Exactly. Right? So what happens if you do the, the blood stain for like the head and your, your neck needs to be like two foot long, right? That just doesn't work, right? So it's clear that any artist would start with, with the body and then add right. um, the, the blood on top, but that's not the case. So the shroud is actually not imaged wherever there's blood. So the blood was there first and it's protecting those fibers because underneath those blood stains, there's no imaging of the shroud. And this, of course, we found about out in the modern era, because shroud science is born in the 20th century. Like, that's when we really started to study this thing, after the first photograph. Maybe that's something we should talk about, because sure. it's, worth, it's worth saying. I think uh, if I can go back to, let's go back to this slide here. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, right here. Okay. This is uh, slide four. It's a picture of Secondo Pia. Mm -hmm. This is the amateur photographer that snapped the first photo of the shroud in wow. 1898. It's about 60 years after the invention of these first dactylographs 
it's just a monstrous machine. You can you can see it on if you go to tour and you they have it on display in the um, in the museum there. And this guy, I love this. Like, what if you're the the family that owns the burial shroud of Jesus, and you like to add a little pageantry to your uh, family wedding or baptism? You just mm-hmm. I'll whip out that burial shroud did of you Jesus. Get, did yeah. you get that photo up? Oh, you got it. Yeah, of Secondo Pia. Yeah. So this is the guy that after 15 minutes of developing the the film goes into the dark room and in this next slide slide three (sighs) that is just this is this is great so this is the one everyone's seen yeah so this is an image uh, of the face now we're zoomed in on the face and on the right side of uh, the screen number three number five it's the juxtaposition of the the two facial images on the right it's the the positive image the linen itself in in beige and if we're honest like okay i can kind of make out a face like there's two eyes there's a nose uh, something like a mustache and and a beard if i'm kind of creative and i squint a little bit Mm -hmm. but if if we're honest like it's it's hard to make out the details but secondo pia was the first one to ever lay eyes on the photo negative wow and so he goes to the dark room and after a time this very slowly this image comes um comes to Emerges, fruition yeah yeah and so he sees like the subtle for example i like to mention the the eyes because if if i were to ask you just pointing at the positive image yeah. the one of, of the linen like where are the boundaries of the eyeballs you might be very inclined to like do like a bart simpson kind of thing where you have these big bulging yeah. eyebrows because it seems like these are these are yeah. like the outlines to the to the eyes mm-hmm. and that explains by the way many icons that show again and again jesus with all of these same characteristics one of them being these these bulging eyes. But when you get to the negative of that, all of a sudden you see a very clear, intelligible human face that this is marking the the, the subtle contours around the eye sockets, mm-hmm. the details of the, the separation of the lips. You've got um, this swelling in the cheeks. You've got a separated septum. If you come two thirds down the nose, you can see that the, the cartilage has been separated according to the American scientists. The beard has been plucked. Wow. Um, you have you, 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 you can see things like the the arterial blood that flows near the the temple. It's from the the frontal vein that's here at the uh, at the t- center of the forehead. We could go on and on about some of do, these, these details. Do. Keep well, doing it. Well, well, we well we well we well. But uh, what I want to say yeah. now is that the first thing to be noticed in 1898 was that this was too good to be true. I see. Instead of applauding Secondo Pia, they Accused him. pointed fingers at him to say, come on, where did you really get this? Wow. And it's not until 1931, some three decades later, that Giuseppe Enrie, now a professional photographer work, working on orthochromatic film, which produces some of the most beautiful um, photos to this day because of the um, the kind of colors that are, are that you that we find it's these, these kind of warm hues that you find on the on the shroud. In any case, he does um, this experiment of f- photographing the whole length of the shroud and sees that indeed the shroud is a photo document. It's it's when you take the negative of the shroud that you don't arrive at a negative. The negative is the positive image, hmm. which suggests, and this is the mind boggling part, right? Is that what is the shroud then? A, sh- a photo negative? Tell me how that works. 19 centuries before the invention of photography, we have a photographic effect in the linen itself. And so it's going to be Yves Delage, who in Paris picks up on this, just noticing the anatomical perfection of this body and that the pathologies that this man suffered are just right on a thousand different details. And they correspond to what we know about of Jesus's sufferings. And so he re- this is an agnostic. He's not a believer, right? But he writes a paper saying that the man of the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth. And they laugh him out of the scientific community. They won't publish his paper in the minutes. And so he has to lament to his friend that, you know, if I were writing to, uh, if I were writing about Xerxes or some Pharaoh or something, no one would have had any trouble. Um, but they're scandalized for some reason that I found a trace of, of Jesus of Nazareth's existence. But he's like, why is that a problem? I don't get it. Um, and yet to this day, we see that anything related to to Christ is, yeah. is because, a sign of contradiction. Because you brought up a point a moment ago that needs to be, I think, reemphasized that at this point, we're not, you don't have to believe this is a supernatural artifact. That's right. And and so it just someone, could, someone could agree that this is the shroud that yes. covered the body of Jesus Christ and still not believe that Christ rose from the dead, that Christianity is true. Exactly. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's kind of like, well, 
even if it is authentic, so what? Like, what what does that show us? Um, and I know some people online get very enthusiastic and they go so far as to say that they think the shroud is like a proof of resurrection. And or I, I actually am more cautious than that. I, I do think it's a sign of resurrection. I, I think that it's certainly compatible and even kind of knocks at the door of your heart saying, come on, explain me. But hmm. at the very least, you know, so much is like, having the right questions. Sometimes we start with a certain bias, a sort of like predisposition to answer just one question. And a lot of the talk and a lot of ink is spilt on radiocarbon dating and is it authentic? I think the better question to ask is, who is this man? Like just here's the data, explain it, right? It's there, it demands an explanation. That's a better starting point. Just gather all the data and see where it leads. You don't have to start with um, the conclusion of Christianity or not, or the opposite, right? Mm. You can actually just just be open to where- it's like, a, the, it's like a philosophical argument for God's existence. Like the world exists, something exists, now explain that. It's exactly that, it's exactly that. And I, I think that we have gone both wrong in both directions, either from a, a, a bias of scientism that mm -hmm a priori excludes the possibility of miracles and the resurrection, or on the other hand, kind of begins with, yeah, that's, we already know that now, what do we even need science for in the first place? And I think both of those are wrong. Like I much prefer what Pope St. John Paul II would say in his first line of the encyclical, Fides et Ratio, where he says, faith and reason are two wings by which the human spirit ascends to the contemplation of the truth. I was like, here's the perfect case study for that. Like, just try it out, like <laughs> faith, and reason. Come with your instruments, come with your, you know, x-ray, your infrared, your ultraviolet, your spectroscopy, your paralysis mass spectroscopy, your sticky tape samples, your blood samples, bring it on. Just like, that's what the church was inviting us to do. Wow. But there's a letter, a very powerful one from Pope St. John Paul II, actually. And, and he was inviting researchers, even non-believers to press, to probe, just leave your bias at the door, just like everybody else and just let's see where it goes. And what, he, what we find out, of course, is that it's a, a mirror of the gospel, is that it actually at so many levels coincides with the gospel story we've always heard recounted. It's just now we have a fifth witness. It's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's, it's the shroud testifying to, these, uh, to the passion. Yeah, I wanna get to that. I wanna get to how the shroud mirrors the gospels. Um, but I guess a few questions first. Is there any credible scientist today making claims about this shroud being inauthentic or oh, dating sure. back to maybe the Middle Ages? And and what is their best argument? It, the best argument is the carbon dating. There's no doubt that when you're talking about um, a linen, which is organic material, the gold standard is carbon dating. Like <coughs> there are other means of, of dating, like with vanillin or with, um, if of course, if there are evidence of coins, that's one way. You could also look to um, the icons to see you could if there were, if there's the pseudodium in other words third parties the other other types of artifacts that would in some set kind of meet the uh, the itinerary the provenance of the shroud so for example just to make this practical um the pseudodium is the head cloth that mm -hmm. covered the body of christ according to john chapter 20 well we have that it's in it's in spain and the blood stains are extremely amorphous and yet they, when juxtaposed onto the shroud, align. Oh my goodness. And the, 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 and the, and the qualities of the blood That's is very, remarkable. very specific, right? So you've got um, a proportion of blood to water that um, indicates lung edema. Mm -hmm. And that's someone who's been scourged, someone who's been severely beaten suffers exactly that. But this is the one that really gets me. If you look to the, um, the blood stain, the rivulet of blood, um, and we looked at the face a moment ago, perhaps we can pull up that same slide that shows that kind of reverse three shape rivulet or an epsilon. And then at the base of it, there's a little droplet. There's a, there's a little circle. I love this because the, the rim is outlined on the shroud. If you look to the pseudodium, you get this same blood stain, but what's empty on the shroud is filled up on the other. Have you got it up there? And so um, that, that's just one example. Wow. You, could, you could read up on the, the work of, I think his name is Alejandro Hermosillo mm -hmm. from uh, Valencia. There's a, there's a shroud studies over there and th there's a center for shroud studies. And he's done some work on the comparative analysis of the shroud on the one hand and the pseudodium on the other. But we know the provenance of the pseudodium. It was on display 
at, in 611, I want to say, certainly the beginning of the seventh century. And, um, and so the shroud, if it covered the same body, is at least as old as that, right? And so we talked already about the Mount Sinai Pantocrator from the sixth century as well. There's many other icons from um, the later medieval period. Um, so these are other ways of dating the shroud. But I, I want to say, and, and this just, I think, is, um, this is just the fact, like, when it comes to organic material, there's no better way to date it than mm -hmm. radiocarbon dating. So uh, why isn't an objection, well, then carbon date it again? No, if, that, if you're so intent right. on showing that this is authentic, then the church shouldn't be afraid to... Well, that's right. I, I think especially if you, if you have more of an understanding of what may be uh, a newer part of the shroud. Is that, was that the problem? Yeah, so we could get into that too. So that top left corner yeah. is exactly where you'd grab the shroud. Like if you wanted to put it on display, and we have like lithograph images of this, where the bishop is with his bare hands just holding up the shroud for hours. <laughs> and and you, that's what you would literally do. You can imagine like uh, making your pilgrimage across Italy to land, just so you could have a few brief moments. Yeah. And this is what always happened whenever there was a public display. People you know, would just pick it up. Uh, and, and yeah, they'd go, and and people would march from across Europe. You have nightmares of this, don't you? you just wake <laughs> up at night in a cold sweat. <laughs> and, and, and but imagine the soil, the wear and tear oh on that top gosh. left corner. Okay, and, so it's not that it was a newer part of cloth. Well, here or... let me finish that story. So because of the wear and tear, it's very likely that it needed to be re repaired in the 16th century. So there was a fire in 1532, and. Um, these these nuns basically tended to the shroud after the fact. Um, did they add a strip of new material? This is one of the theories. There's a fun little story behind this. There's this woman who's watching TV. Her name is Sue Benford. She's not a scientist. She's a librarian, if I'm not mistaken. She's since passed away. But um, she's watching this on TV and she says, that face convinces me that's Jesus. I got to study this thing. So get this. She gets a picture, like a a blown up image of the textile and then shows it to textile experts. And again and again, without knowing what they're looking at, they simply describe what they see. A misaligned weave. They tell her about French invisible weave. The idea is that you would put one thread or mm -hmm. one cloth uh, next to another and without putting like a seam in between the two cloths, it, you would what you create what's called a splice. You would uh, un unravel the threads on the one end, do the same on the new cloth, and then just splice the threads together so that it looks like one piece. It's very expensive, it's very difficult, but it was known, and we have books about it, in the 16th century. The problem is that the new material is going to be white with respect to the linen that has yellowed over time. And so they added a plant gum that's new organic material now in order to make it all uniform color. Mm. And so this was studied um, uh, long after the fact, even after Sue Benford Present, pre presents a paper in Orvieto at one of these shroud congresses, and it gets published on the most um, scientific website online, which is shroud.com. And this is when the head chemist of um, the STIRP, the Shroud of Turn Research Project, his name is Ray Rogers, he gives Barry Schwartz a call and says, what are you doing publishing this paper from the lunatic fringe on our scientific, scientific website? And he was like, well, Ray, I mean, she follows the scientific method. I think the people ought to know what, what a good hypothesis is. And hey, if it needs to be scrutinized and uh, you know destroyed, well, let it be so, you know? And he's like, I'm gonna prove it wrong in five minutes. He's like, well, Ray, go ahead. You know, they hang up the phone. <laughs> Imagine this, Ray was at Sterp again in 1978. Um, I'm not sure what year this is, but I wanna say around 2000, somewhere there, because there, uh, Ray Rogers is dying of cancer. This guy's like racing against the clock to prove his, his theory. But what happens when he hangs up the phone is he goes back to, I guess, his little manila folder or whatever, where he's got a little strip of, of the shroud. He went home with a sample of the shroud that he could put under a microscope and examine, and he finds cotton. Of course, the shroud has no cotton. It's all linen. But he, he says, I can't believe I'm saying this, Barry, calling him back now, but I think she's right. And so Barry Schwartz will like race against the clock all the, the time he's got left on this earth to present one last paper and show and arguing um, in favor of this theory of French invisible weave, basically that although the shroud be from the first century, there was a strip that's from the 16th century so that what those different laboratories were actually analyzing was a, a blend of first century and 16th century material 
thus giving us this medieval date, which is, of course, an average. Because I don't know if you know, I should explain for our listeners how radiocarbon works. Please. And but, for me. And yeah. So anybody, any, any of us that are alive and breathing are taking in oxygen and replenishing our carbon all the time. So if you look at a table of elements, you're going to see the periodic table. You're going to see that it's carbon 12 because of the number of protons that it has. But there are other isotopes too, other flavors of carbon, if you like. C14 is radioactive. So it sheds those uh, extra protons over time at a known rate. And so we know the half-life, how long it takes for this C14 to shed these, these, this extra material. And so 5,370 years, I want to say, is the half-life of C14, which simply means I take a sample, I shove it in a machine, I calculate the molecules that are there, and I get an exact date of when that plant died or when that person died in the case of, uh, you know, human biological material. Okay. But the, it simply means that the, uh, the flax from which linen comes was mm -hmm. chopped down mm. at, in, in the first century. It stopped replenishing its, uh, yeah. its carbon, and that now we can, we can get an exact date. But what they didn't tell you in 1988 was that each of these laboratories, again, Arizona, Zurich, and Oxford, they got different dates. And even Arizona because it got two strips, it got an initial strip and they're, oops, sorry guys, we, we short changed you. Let me snip off another little sliver. Mm -hmm. So it's only two centimeters away, perhaps on the cloth. Mm -hmm. And yet there's some 200 year difference mm. between Arizona one and Arizona two, the two samples. And this, they didn't tell you that as you move left to right across the shroud, you go from an older date to a younger date. And so if it's 1240 and then 1440 within a couple of centimeters like what's the date when i move 4.4 meters to the right like is it a date in the future when i get over there <laughs> they didn't tell you any of this they just said oh we're sure it's from the middle ages it was just really disappointing now now that we all the data is out um and so i think you're absolutely right everybody's on the same page we want to do it again but i think the international how accurate is carbon dating how within um uh, okay some have said maybe they were wrong but even even that so, they're not wrong by that much. Mm -hmm. Like if you didn't have um, this uh, theory of the French invisible weave, you would have to theorize some sort of contamination, whether by fire or by some fungus of sorts. Or there'd, uh, there'd have to be introduced a, uh, a significant amount of organic material from another period in order to skew it that much. Because... It's it's precise to within a few years. Okay. It's 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 actually not it's not a matter of like two hundred years or something like that. No. Okay. It's it is precise. But after So do this, you think if this carbon dating was allowed to take place, that would settle the argument? I mean, I think it would be helpful. Settle the uh, argument for, that is as to opposed say, to when it was Yeah. First. I, if if it's done right, yes. I think, you know, we should have followed the protocol that we initially established. Seven different samples from different areas of the shroud. Obviously, you're gonna destroy and therefore you want to be careful about where you choose to draw the threads from and as you know time advances so does the technology and so maybe mm -hmm. we can destroy less material yeah. and in such a way that you want to preserve us above all the the body image and this is a relic so you don't want to be haphazard about just well, what's interesting is even if you take that theory that this is a medieval invention which as we've said has been debunked but even if you took that theory you're still left to explain how the hell do you produce an image like this well that's right even now let alone in the middle ages and, and this is the question i like to ask my friend barry schwartz because he, he's not a believer, and yet he travels the world talking about the authenticity of the shroud. So what does he think it is? Well, well this is what I ask him. I say, well, well, because he, he likes to give this great analogy, which I follow. Like he says, I think it's a Sherlock Holmes <clears throat> episode or a, a little short story or something where Watson says, hey, Sherlock, like, or no, Sherlock to Watson says, Watson, if you've got four theories mm -hmm. on, or, or five theories in That's all. That's the Hounds of Baskerville, I think. Oh, look <laughs> at that. It's the, where it's go. Like all of the theories have been yeah, disproved. The most because... Yeah, because it's the hellhounds of Baskerville. <laughs> yes. And he says it's impossible. You you just like satisfied decades of my searching for that because I, I forgot that, <laughs> that. But I love the the reference. So it's something like this. Like if there are five theories on the table and four can be discarded or disproved, you can know, Watson, that the one that remains is surely true. And the, so is, it helped me. Whatever, whatever, when, when what is impossible is removed, whatever is left, however improbable, must be true. 
Give this, this guy a raise, all right. okay? I don't know how much money you're making, but if that's your producer, like, that's fantastic. Yeah, so, no way Neil could have done that. <laughs> so your face, cut, by Neil. the way, at the end of this. But um, so the the naturalistic um, theories have been discarded. We know that it's not a painting. We know that it's not a scorch because mm-hmm. of the ultraviolet fluorescence. We know that it's not a camera scorch. There are no highlights. There are no shadows. There, there's like I said, there's nothing impressed upon the cloth. There's no directionality, no brush strokes. So, if we're unable to reproduce it with any of these means, and by the way, I would be much more convinced if all of these dump debunkers were on the same page. Because look, if it's a painting, it's not a scorch. If it's a scorch, yeah. it's not a rubbing. If it's a rubbing, right. it's not a photograph. It's like, guys, choose figure one. out which one it is, but and it's not all four. An yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, the other thing is, um, if all of those fail, and we can say this with, I, I use the word prove sparingly, but I use it here. We can prove that it's not any of those things. Mm-hmm. And so th- if all those naturalistic yeah. um, theories fail, th- this is where the Christian can raise it. Well, how about another idea? Well, what's Barry's answer? Oh, well, he'll just shrug his shoulders. And I think that's fair. Like, a, like if you want to be... It's a very Jewish kind of... No, that is to say, it, he'll say, disavow. I don't know. I don't know. Disavow. No, he's like, well, he holds out. He says, we can't explain it today. It's not that it's in sure. unexplainable. But this is what the atheists do about the world. <laughs> I've yes, just exactly. been informed I got the wrong Sherlock Holmes story. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Okay, so give go- her a raise. <laughs> that took humility, what was bro. It? Which one was it? Sign of four. Mm. Okay. I got to do some reading. Well, that's good. I learned something here today, so I'm happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess, where was I going with that? The uh, He shrugs his shoulders. He shrugs his shoulders. And he says, Thank there you. will be an answer. There yeah. isn't one now. And that's a fair. That's, that is. I respect is that. that. I, yeah. I respect that. The one who says, like, okay, you brought me to the brink, the uh, the limits of my I knowledge. I agree, it's not paint. I agree, it's not exactly. whatever. Exactly, and I can't explain it today, but maybe tomorrow we, we will. So why, why, okay, fair enough. But I, I want to say this, is that we're all, at the end of the day, more than a empiricists. Yes, as a scientist, qua scientist, I'm going to say, I can't explain this. Yeah. But I'm a man. I have all the, or the all my faculties, that, and, and I have to, at the end of the day, say yay or nay, what do I think? And there I have to take in all, all that I know. And I think this is really does bring to the fore this the question of the interplay between faith and reason. It's like re- reason brings you to the shore and you've been walking and now mm-hmm. it's time to swim. But it's like, how much evidence do you need? Like, if I could just take one element just to highlight this. Um, if we were to make a list of all of those candidates, all those people who were crowned and crucified, there's exactly one person on that list, and that's Jesus of Nazareth. If there are other people that were crowned and crucified, and that may have been the case, but nobody ever wrote about it. And so what's the probability that it's not Jesus when you have this unique combination of sufferings that you have nail wounds in the feet? And in the hands, a pierced side, evidence that he carried the cross, that he was nailed to the cross, that he was crowned with thorns, that he was punched in the face. All of this is here. And then, and then you pile on other things like pollen that can, that is consonant with the, the flora that blossoms between April and May in, within a radius of, I think, five kilometers of Jerusalem. And, and then you have um, soil. Soil This is a very elaborate kind of hoax. Yes. No, I want to shake this guy's hand. Like, if this, right. Yeah, it's like, who is this guy? Like, <laughs> yeah. this guy Forget needs... the guy on the shroud. <laughs> Let's Who's worship him. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, if it's a fake, we need to, like, develop a following of whoever faked it, yeah. honestly, oh, to oh, some yeah. degree, because he's a genius. Yeah, you know, it's beyond genius. So just to give an example of this, like, there's soil. There's soil on the feet and and knees and nose. It's, it's terrible to think about what that implies for, for the Via Crucis. Like, when he fell, he fell flat to his face and Mm. some 75 to 125 pounds came crashing down on a head uh, crowned with thorns. The forensic doctors don't agree on much, but they agree that those thorns penetrate through the skin to the bony plate below. And and so that, that on the, exactly amen to that. But um, from a scientific point of view, we can study this soil that's on the feet, knee and nose and determine its chemical composition we know that it's calcium carbonate with a s- touch of strontium, and we know further it's um, what's crystalline structure to be travertine aragonite, which is an extremely rare crystalline structure. And yet, according to one geologist, it 
matches the soil of the grottoes of Jerusalem like a fingerprint, she says. And so, again, if it is fabricated in France in the Middle Ages, what in the world is it doing with soil from Palestine there, right, uh, on, on the, precisely in those areas where it would have contact with the ground? And so it's really, it's the cumulative force of all of these different elements. I don't think it's any one thing that kind of like hammers it home. Sure, some, some are more important than others. Some elements are more important than others. Um, but it really is um, the bringing together the convergent, the convergent evidence that is again and again consonant with what we know from, from scripture and what, what has been passed down and received by our tradition. Who's the leading academic that would call this into question? And what does he say in response to this uh, publisher retracting the original debunking of it? Well, some have said, so Nicoletti is a book that just came out by, I want to say Baker or Baker Academic. Um, I'm going to forget the title of the book, sorry. But um, there have been all kinds of debunkers along the way in Italy. A big one is Garla Schelli. Um, but there are, you know, YouTube videos that you can easily find that, that will go into this. But they're basically holding on to that, the idea that, that this is a medieval fake and that the carbon dating, though it wasn't definitive, if we were to do it again, I bet you get, we'd get the same uh, kind of mm. uh, 13th century outcome. And so... Um, it, what? Because remember, in, nine, in 2017, what was shown was simply that you can't reach this conclusion. It might be by other ways we can reach that conclusion. It's simply that with the data that was used um, in 1988, it doesn't bring you to this conclusion. In other words, it's a non sequitur, right? You would need to do it again. But it does leave open the question. So it may be the case that we, re, like maybe tomorrow, and this, would, this wouldn't be a problem. Some people have pretended that, Christians are out there saying that oh, the, oh, the case for Christianity rests upon the authenticity of the shroud. Like we would sleep easy tonight if we got a new test saying, hey, you know what? The shroud is medieval and it's, it doesn't tell us anything about the, the suffering. I think that would be kind of unfortunate. Like I'm glad that there is. There's no ex- way you would sleep easy if that was discovered, especially given what you've just shared about the pollen well, and the soil. Okay, fair enough. I would, I would be disappointed. Yeah. But I, th- th- that is to say, but it wouldn't. It wouldn't shake my faith in it Christianity. Shake the foundations of my, the my faith. faith yeah. My faith in Christianity. So our our faith rests upon eyewitness testimony. Yeah. And what I think is really cool. I mean, obviously, we have Mary Magdalene. We had those the first apostles. They tell their story. Some five hundred saw him at one time, risen from the dead. And so um, these people, when they had nothing to gain and everything to lose, mm-hmm. they went to their death professing faith in the resurrection when it was known to be false that people rise from the dead. Like nobody in the ancient world believed such a thing that people come back from the dead to live new glorified resurrected lives. Like that's the the premise and thesis of N.T. Wright's big book mm-hmm. on the resurrection, mm-hmm. right? Like Christianity came into a world where its central premise was already known to be false. And, and yet a whole swath of the society went on board and changed their day of worship from Saturday into Sunday because evidently, they thought something happened on Easter Sunday. And so whether it's true or whether or not, what you can't deny is that they believed it to be true. Mm -hmm. And so now you have to account as a historian, like why in the world would they believe this? And so what I think is cool is that those were eyewitnesses to the living Jesus. But if you were to ask, okay, who saw the moment that cadaver became a glorified, divinized human body? Nobody was there, right? Mary Magdalene gets up early, but not early enough, right? She's mm-hmm. she's late. She slept in. He's gone. The, the 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 tomb is empty, and so the shroud becomes the silent witness to that event, which I think is amazing. Because of course, when she goes to the tomb, I know we call it an empty tomb, but what you read about is that it's not empty. In fact, it's what they find there that when they find it, the way that they find it, they begin to believe. And so I think it's so powerful that in John 20, verse 8, it says, John saw and believed. And this is where I want to take him by the lapels and be like, slap him across the cheeks a little bit. What did you see? So that you believed. This is, this is the first distinctive Christian faith attested anywhere in the scriptures. And it's when, why not? Why can't that just mean he saw an empty tomb? Well, what you described, can we pull that up actually? Because yeah. that's worth talking about this is such a good question. oh you'll look up the scripture yeah let's let's read that because the um 
I think this has not been given nearly enough attention in the scholarly literature and also with regard to Shroud studies. And so I'm glad for the question. I'm just going to pull up my Bible here and uh, I'll check it out in Greek. And just for those who are watching right now, if you're a local supporter, go to mattfrad.locals.com. We've got a private chat going on so you can join that and ask questions. And uh, I will be sure to uh, ask Father your questions at some point in the episode. Do you want me to ask some of this, or have you already looked it up? I don't want. Yeah, to... no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. So this is John chapter twenty, All right. and this we know well because it's what we proclaim on Easter Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early while it's still dark and sees that the stone's been taken away, and so she goes and tells Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, that's John, um, and says they've taken away the Lord. He's not in the tomb. I don't know where they laid him. So Peter and John go running. And in verse four, it says they're running together, but mm-hmm. John goes faster. I guess Peter is a little, a little older, a little slow, maybe a little extra pounds on the gut. I don't know, but he, he doesn't get there first. John does. I love this detail in verse five. John bends <clears throat> down and says he stoops. He stoops. And the reason this is significant is because it coincides with what we know from archaeology in first century tombs. Interesting. There's a stairwell down that okay. leads to an antechamber and then against the wall, like on a shelf, much like in the catacombs, if you've been there, you'll see that's where the body would be lay, would, would, would lie. And so Simon Peter goes in first. But first, it's uh, John who sees from a distance the linen cloths. That's the word that I'm reading. I'm reading from the ESV. If you get into different translations, you're going to get different uh, vocabulary here. But the linen cloths, notice the S at the end. It's because in the... So read it from the scriptures. It says what? In verse 5, in stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths. Interesting. So it's blepe kemenata othonia. So he sees from, he sees the othonia, that's a neuter plural. And that's why we add S to the to the it's burial cloths or linen cloths. And the question is, what in the world was that? Especially since in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we get a different word. We get the word sindon, which is shroud, like a long sheet. Mm-hmm. that cover- So it's a sindon in Mark, I think, 15. Remember that young man that mysteriously is like runs away naked when yeah. they tear away his tunic or whatever? That's a sindon. That's a shroud. So it's evidently something big enough to, to cover a body. Um, but the point is here that's that... Uh, John from a distance, he doesn't go in, but he gets low because now yeah. he t- gets a good angle to see deep inside. And what he sees from a distance is the, this linen cloth. Okay, that's interesting. But what happens next? Simon goes in. Like I can just imagine John saying, after you, Holy Father, like he waited <laughs> for for Peter. And now Peter steps down that the threshold of the where the the stone would have been rolled away into the antechamber. And he tells us what he sees coming into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths, that's the second mention of this word, othonia, and look at this, he saw the linen cloths lying there. In other translations, it adds funny words like lying on the ground, but I'm here in the Greek and I can tell you that it does nothing of the sort. Hmm. It just says, theore ta othonia kemana, he saw the linen cloths lying. And um, it's also interesting to note that he changed the verb to see. In English, we're going to get three times, he saw, he saw, and he saw. But in John's language, he changes vocabulary, and I think that's intentional. It seems that there's a crescendo in light. He's seeing, but we're seeing more and more. So in a first moment, what does Peter see extra that John didn't see? Well, he sees the linen cloths lying and the face cloth, that's the sudarium, um, which had been on Jesus' head, it tells us, not lying with the linen cloths. That's a third mention in three verses of the same exact word, Mm. Othonia, Mm. but folded up in a separate place. And you're like, come on, John, there are a thousand details. I wish I could know about the passion of Christ. Like how big were the thorns? Uh, Where did they pierce him in the side? How many scourge marks? Um, Mm. But it's like relegated to a subordinate clause. And then he keeps on going. But boy, when it's time to tell you about the dirty laundry in the tomb, like he's going on and okay. on about it. Okay. And that got to catch your attention. Like, what is the purpose? What is the purpose here? Where is he going with this discourse? And finally, in verse eight, he comes to the clim- climactic conclusion to say, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, right? He also went in and he saw and believed. And it's not blepo. That was the first verb. 
It's not theoreo, that's the second verb that Peter sees, but now it's horao, that he saw and believed. And so, especially being used in conjunction with the verb to believe, there's the sense that there's sight that is natural, and then there's sight that is supernatural. They're seeing and then they're seeing, right? And these are the first baby steps towards that fundamental belief that, yeah, it founds the rest of our faith. If, if we take Paul seriously anyway, when he says, if Christ isn't raised, your faith is in vain. Like it all rests upon this. And here's the testimony bearing its witness. He saw, what did he see? There's a, there's a detail here. I wish I could jump in one of those time machines with uh, Michael J. Fox or whatever, and, like reconstruct the scene of like what exactly they saw. There's lots of fun theories out there. We can get into that if you want. But um, what I do know is this, that it's because he saw what he saw. In other words, the condition of the empty tomb. And it's what's quoted in the catechism, if I'm not mistaken. It's, what is it, 460? or No, I think it's 640. I sometimes get dyslexia on hmm. these things. But um, it says that it's the condition of the empty tomb that led them to belief. And so whatever they saw, it, 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 was, it, was vis- it started with something visible something sensible. And so this is where I want to go to the text and say like, okay, what clues do you got for me here? Anything? And there is something and it's fundamental. It's not much, but it may just be all we need. I come back to that, that, that funky sentence that is so, that is translated with such difficulty. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And I told you in, in Spanish, for example, they say lying on the ground. We read this in our liturgy in Spanish. I think that's unfortunate because it doesn't say on the ground, as if the point were to say, it's not on the staircase, it's not on the on the sill where his body lay. No, it's on the ground. No, that's there. That's they pull that out of thin air. It doesn't mm. say that. It, nor does it say lying there, as if to say not here, but there. The, the word there is not in the, in the Greek. It's just not there. It's just it's just not there. <laughs> but it does say that they're lying, and the word kemena means can mean lying flat, as it, like so. If the body has dematerialized. I don't like that term, but you get the, it communicates what I'm trying to get at. If the body is no longer there, such that the cloth that surrounded it can now collapse, the result might be described as a cloth lying, like a balloon that's lost its air. Mm. It's got nothing inside and so that it can collapse. I see. If, add one more detail. The fact that it's a plural and not a singular. It's not a shroud, but it's here. It's the linen cloths. Okay. So what else do we know here? According to the American scientists, According to, the, if you look to the beard, there's a depression in the beard, evidencing mm-hmm. a strap, a cloth that would have kept the mouth closed so that after rigor mortis relaxes, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have a, a, a mouth just gaping wide open. It would be, it would be tied, tied closed. Likewise, there's a strap evidently over the ankles, but below the knees that's keeping the, the mm-hmm. legs together. Um, and, and so it seems that the man is taller on the front of the cloth than he is if you were to measure from the back because there's a fold in the cloth because of this strap. And so some have theorized that in addition to the sindon, which is that long sheet that kind of folds above and below the body, you have these other strips that bring together at certain points um, and, t- and contain uh, the body. This is really interesting if you, if you know John 11, because that's when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb mm-hmm. and he gives him a command. Do you remember what he says? As untie he comes him, up, untie him, untie him. him. There it is. Mm. And so evidently there's something to untie. And so could it, be, could it be that something similar is here in Jesus's case that John, who was there at the foot of the cross on Friday, and now he's back on Sunday morning and he sees what he saw before, except no body. Wow. And so he might've described it in this way. The bottom line is this, what, What we have in the text says that it's not that he crucified his intellect when he came to believe. No, he departed from something that was intelligible and then carried it forward when he came into an encounter with Mm -hmm. Jesus. And that's where this itinerary ends. It moves from seeing certain details that are fuzzy and at a distance. Then we come up close and personal. And then we get even, uh, then we get the vision of faith but then it climaxes in encounter when when Mary Magdalene uh, encounters the Lord, and that's where that's where our faith journey ends too. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. de- come press and probe, like study the shroud, but don't like don't be unbelieving, but yeah, believe. Yeah. See with faith. Holy mackerel! Okay, so I know you want to draw out a lot of things from Scripture, um, 
But can I, can we get to some questions? You bet. But Let's before do we do that, can I tell people to go check out hallow.com slash Matt? It is the number one Christian. Matt Fred. Matt Fred. I think, I think Matt works as well. Oh. H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Fred. You're right, Thursday. Um, Matt Fred. Uh, check him out because it's the number one Catholic app on the interwebs. I think it might be the number one Christian app. Don't quote me. It's a bloody fantastic app and it'll help you to pray. And I know a lot of people for your New Year's resolution said you'd like to do that more. What's cool about Hallow is it'll help you do that. And um, it's really well produced. And if you go to hallow.com slash Matt Fred, the link is in the description below and sign up there. You'll get a three month free trial, which is just ridiculous. So after the end of those three months, if you don't agree with me that it's as good as I'm saying, you can... Um, unsubscribe and you won't pay a cent but it'll help you it'll lead you through the rosary it has nighttime stories bedtime stories you can listen to it has stories for your children that you can play for them at night um it really is absolutely excellent and um a hundred percent catholic so if you want to pray the rosary if you want to learn how to meditate in a catholic fashion please check it out hallow.com slash matt fried click the link in the description below sign up there that way they Know that I sent you, and you'll get those three months for free. All right, can also I also sign up on the website so that you, um, if you, I know a lot of people in the communities don't want to give more money to Apple or Google than they need to. That's right. So if you sign up on the website, then Apple and Google don't get a cut through the payment processing on your phone. Thank you. Yep. All right, so uh, Heidi, thanks for being a local supporter, says, "Who is dragging their feet on the proper dating of it?" Who has to approve it? So I think that goes back to the question of, okay, right. we did carbon dating, but it was on. Right. Uh, but w so if, if a new carbon dating thing would actually prove it, <coughs> whose Why permission not? do we got to get? Right. So as of 1983, the shroud was bequeathed from the royal family to the person of John Paul II because he is the successor of Peter. Mm -hmm. So it is... As of 1983, that's like recent history. That's like I yesterday in the that, grand yeah. scheme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now it is the property of Francis. Okay. So, of course, he has a delegate in Turin. It's the archbishop there in, in Turin. And he ha also has, you know, people under him that tend to the nitty gritty. But I think what would need to happen is that the scientific community would have to reach a kind of consensus as in order to suggest like, mm. hey, this is not just what needs to be done, but the exact way in which it needs to be orchestrated so that the community so at large again. can yeah. be confident mm -hmm. that the results are credible. And so after the fiasco of 1988, nobody's like just itching to do this. And I just wanna say that we're in a great place right now to talk about the Shroud. And we need more people. I, I love what I do. I love that I get to go around the world talking about the Shroud. And I have in, in, in China and in Hong Kong and Singapore and the Philippines and throughout Europe and here in the States. Um, but I wish I didn't have to in a way. Like I wish there were other people mm. that would get on board and, and do this. So thank you, by the way, for the platform to share this. But people need to know that they can get educated on this. At, do a postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies from Othonia. It's in Spanish. It's in it's in Italian and it's in English and learn about it, share about it, bring it to your parish, um, bring it to your catechism classes. People need to hear this. You never need, you never know who, who can benefit from this kind of discourse. I think it's really sad that we've kind of dumbed down our catechesis, our strategizing for uh, evangelization has often been like more carpets in our, uh, in our chapels and more, you know, electric guitars and that kind of thing. What if we were to like, turn up the volume on the intellectual side of Christianity. I think some people need to hear some of these these details and you never know who can be helped. I've, I've certainly seen it again and again in young so people. So we'll put a link to this Athonia. Yeah. So if people want to do a, a post-grad certificate in this, they can. Great. While I'm on the topic, I know you have a new podcast that's about mm. to drop and I want people to know about it before Thank we get you. to more questions because you, I, I know you, I know Father Michael, you're two of the most brilliant and charming priests I've ever met. So I cannot <laughs> wait until your podcast starts. We're going to put a link in the description below to your podcast, Those Two Priests. I know Those you don't, Two Priests. Yeah, I know you don't have any videos yet, yeah. but I want to tell everybody, click that link. Do we have a link? We'll have a link up there soon and subscribe to their podcast. So once you guys you. Start, start dropping videos. Yeah, no, and thank you for the idea. 
It's AthoniaInternational.org, right? Okay. It's yeah. We can. I'll give you the exact link to the postgraduate certificate because sure. what we have is the Science and Faith Institute, which yep. is under the big umbrella of this pontifical university, and it's complicated. So I'll just get you the sure. direct link and put it in in the description um, for those who want to follow along. But yeah, thanks for that um, word about the podcast. I'm excited about that. It's not going to be uh, only shroud related. The idea right. is that. We're just going to have conversation as two priests that want to yeah. shoot the breeze with people um, who from different okay. aspects, much like much like you do here, quite yeah. quite honestly. But cool. um, I think I'm, excited, I'm for excited for it too. I think it's going to be good. So we're just building the studio now, and hopefully we'll be right behind, right with you guys. That's great. Okay, uh, Vespers says, do we have any other extant? burial shrouds or similar textiles from that mm. time period. For example, when the tomb of St. Peter was discovered, there were bits of purple cloth, and we know that his bones were wrapped in a purple cloth when the original basilica was built. Are there other grave shrouds like this? Nothing like this is the answer to the question. The shroud is an absolute unicum for these three reasons, and it's worth uh, repeating that the shroud bears an image of a man, um, an image that is anatomically perfect. That's one. Two, that it acts as a photo negative where the grayscale is inverted. And then three, that it encodes three dimensional information. There's not a single other cloth that has any of those characteristics. Are there other burial cloths? Yeah, even predating the shroud, um, but also from the period. I think right there in Jerusalem, like a stone's throw from this holy sepulcher. Um, just to the south, like towards Gehenna, there is a, a cave that is, is called something like uh, the Field of the Shroud because of some uh, cloths that were found. And I'm sure there there are many others that we could we could point to. I don't have the, off the top of my head. Um, but um, this is extremely rare. Obviously, if you have a decomposing body next to a linen cloth, it's going to decompose much more rapidly. Um, one of the things that is surprising about the shroud is that there are no signs of decomposition or putrefaction anywhere on this body, which, uh, to my mind, harkens back to Psalm 16, right? Where, do you remember mm -hmm. Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 2, and Peter quotes the psalm and says, you will not allow your beloved to mm -hmm. see corruption. Um, th of course, he's using the scriptures to talk about the resurrection of Christ. Now he's applying this verse to to Jesus. But it also applies neatly to what we know about from the shroud, that there's no signs that rigor mortis has been relaxed. There's no signs that um, out of the nose and mouth that pneumonia gas exited out of these uh, these passages. Wow. And, and you would expect that. And it would be a very different and gruesome image that you would find if a, a dead body had stayed in contact with that shroud wow. longer than 40 hours. Wow. That's when That's when rigor mortis relaxes. But somewhere between 30 and 36 hours mm -hmm. of course if you if you zoom in on the on the blood stains especially at the wrists which are very crisp and neat in their um in their limits in their contours it shows that this is dried blood that is re-softened by a process called fibrinolysis ever so slowly but it's a ticking clock it tells us how long that blood stain is in contact with the cloth so as to create this stain and the answer that the scientists give us is that somewhere between 30 to 36 hours um, after initiation, fibrinolysis was interrupted. And so what that means is that not only did the body um, not extend beyond rigor mortis, but it, which never relaxed, but the body is no longer in contact with the cloth beyond the 30 or maximally the 36 hour mark. So we're talking, if you do the math with me a little bit, if Jesus is tucked away in the tomb before the third star in the sky appears when the Sabbath rest descends upon them, um, it's probably, let's say it's 6 p.m. 30 hours later is midnight on Easter Sunday. 6 a.m. is, is, you know, six hours later, they're in, in the wee small hours of Easter Sunday. They're telling us somewhere between midnight and 6 a.m., the body is no longer in contact with the claw. Wow. And so these, again, this is where I say it's, it certainly leaves room to say the least for the Christian hypothesis. And so what do we make of it? What sense do we make of it? So to, to answer the question of the, per, of the person is, do we have anything, any other cloth? Um, yeah, you can look to things like, is it a Z or is it an S twist? Things like that. Do they know how to do a three to one herringbone weave? Yes. This, these kinds of things we know, but to my mind, that's lower down on the chain, right? I mean, the more important aspects that, that count, let's say, it's, uh, they all have to do with the image. And there we just find nothing, nothing remotely close. Um, even when we engineer them, knowing all the characteristics today, 
at a microscopical level, they're not they're not close. I would love to see the closest representation of the shroud that we've mm. been willing to put off. Uh, I'll show you some. Oh, you've got some? Yeah. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm pumped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so- There was, it, there was while well, you looked that up, there was some comedian, I forget <laughs> if it was Brian Regan, who said that we don't get a sense of just how good these athletes are at the, the Olympic games. Mm-hmm because they're all running next to each other and they're all really good. So what oh, we need to do yes. is get some yeah. fat guy like me yeah. from the stands and have yeah, them yeah, run yeah, alongside. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to see the comparison between oh, what yeah. we've been able to accomplish. No, it's great. I, I always love these guys when they you try. Yeah, I'll pull it up for you now. I'm, I'm scrolling. So let's go to, what, which one does that say? 60? 60 of 63. 60 yeah. of 63. So this is one. There's some more as we scroll down, but let's do 60. Um, so there are some that have said that the shroud, it's really bad. They call it instead of the shroud of Turin. I'm sorry, Lord, to say it, but the shroud of urine. Have you heard this before? No. Because what you can do is get this emulsion on a cloth. You, you it's pass. It's very clever. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Of urine. But, but look, Someone's it's, like, it's what not if? clever. <laughs> it's a bit clever. But that <laughs> so, might be because I'm a dad. So dad jokes appeal <laughs> dad to me. Jokes. Anyway. So the, the theory here is that if you have a dark room, yeah. something like with a, a kind of photographic effect, they said, what if you had a body out in the sunlight and then, you know, passing through this prism, see this little hole in the wall in the yeah. top right? And then what would happen is it would be projected, the image would be projected now upside down and it would create a photo negative and it works. Like the amazing thing is it actually does produce the image mm. of the body. Like you put a statue out in the sun and it'll do that. There's a, I think it's National Geographic that has this guy in a white lab coat. I'm going to forget his name. I know it's, it's Nichols. I think Nickel, Joe Nickel. I want to say Joe Nickel. Um, but he's a magician by trade, but he dresses up with a fancy white coat to, to, pre, to present his theory to you, um, which I'm at the end of the day, super happy about because what he produces, though it's impressive, is nothing like the shroud because it has clear highlights. Look at the top of the feet. Mm-hmm. Look mm -hmm. at the top of the hands and the, uh, and then the shadow under the chin and mm -hmm. under, under, the, under the hands. There are no highlights and shadows anywhere on the shroud. And they don't tell you this in the National Geographic version, but that image can only last a matter of days. No you expose way. it to sunlight and it just disappears. And you have to think about, imagine a human body, anatomically perfect, in the sun for four days. That's how long you need in order <laughs> to project the image. Uh -huh. What does that body look like after four days? Like, uh, I'm... The flesh is, is still hanging on the on the body. I don't know. And they have to turn it around and do it again for another four days to get to get the back of the body. Again, this is not uh, going to show up in the in the literature, but that's uh, or the because when you're making it, you have to realize that when you're watching a uh, documentary, you got to who's paying for that documentary and what what is their interest. It's not the same as peer reviewed scientific journal articles yes. that have to sustain the scrutiny of their peers in order to then. Okay, so that's one. That's a, that's if the shroud were a uh, a photograph, a kind of camera oscura made by Leonardo da Vinci, they say, right in the uh, 13th century or the or, or or thereabouts. No, never mind that he he's born like a hundred years later, but that's a uh, minor detail. Okay. Um, the other one here is Garlaschelli uh, here in the the center, the middle, uh -huh. the middle, a kind of drawing, but. Again, we don't have anything soaked into the fibers. There are no brush strokes. There's no directionality. Um, there's no way. I mean, it impressive as it might are you be. Still uh, it's still in sixty, but at the bottom uh, center, the black you know, and white. The black and white. I believe that's Garlaschelli's image. Uh, this is. Uh, yeah, uh, that looks. That looks almost. Like the, I, I this one. I thought that was the real one. Oh no no no! So the the one on the right. Uh, I'll well bring up the other the original to, so you can compare and contrast. But again, it's the chemical. Um, aspects, the chemical composition, and the the microscopic level. That's where these utterly fail. Um, the, these aren't surface phenomena. They're, remember, we have mm. we can only penetrate the, the two to five hundred nanometers. Uh, they're not even remotely close at that level. Mm -hmm. Even if you think like artistically, they're they're convincing. This one is Emily. Oh gosh, <laughs> I forgot her last name. Uh, it's like coming or something like that. But um, who thinks that it's a rubbing? You ever do like in like a mm -hmm. kindergarten where you put yeah. a leaf under a yeah. paper oh, yeah, and you yeah. like with a crayon, you know? So it is impressive that it is also a way too accurate and um, it looks like a medical drawing or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh, it's impressive, but again, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the, the characteristics that what's really enigmatic about the shroud is that even though it's been exposed to water, indeed like soaked in water, 
such that there are water stains. No. It's, it, there are water stains on top of the body image, and they don't obscure or dilute or mess up in the least the body image. Neither did the, the fire, right? So there, there are, what you can see, and we should pull this up for the crowd here. Let's go to those first slides. I can't remember what was it like number four or so that shows these um, here. There's a good one. Um, number six uh, that shows the, um, the triangles that you see yeah. here, here, and here. They're kind of these symmetrical patterns. It's because the shroud was folded up. Mm. Uh, a court, there's four dividing lines so it folded in half right there in the center, then fold what remains in <laughs> half and then half again so that the face is what remains. That would have been most interesting to those who wanted to show it off or mm. venerate the, the shroud. And then, you, of course, you fold it along the long axis and, and then you get the four-folded garment. In fact, that's one of the names in history that we know of a linen cloth that bears the image of the Savior, the tetradiplon. It just means the four-folded linen mm. corresponds to the four folds we find on the shroud. But that's what creates these symmetrical patterns because inside the, the shroud, once folded, is inside of a silver casing and that in the fire melts down and singes the outer edges of the folded cloth. <clears throat> and so the result is this. The the fire, however, did not destroy the body image. The high temperatures didn't mess up. That That's absolutely the case with every painting that we know. Um, the, the same could be said about uh, scorching. Like the, one of the theories was that you take a statue, mm -hmm. heat it up, yeah. put a cloth on top, and Real then quick. like singe it, yep. right? That would be a scorch. But again, it's uh, the scientific uh, data that's important here. If you look at the ultraviolet fluorescence, that would tell you where there's a scorch and it's impossible that this is a scorch not 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 improbable but utterly impossible so again we can discard all of the mm. all of those uh, attempts at re reading the shroud are are so unlike what we actually have that we should be able to say thanks but no thanks mm -hmm. like this this is not a feasible way of uh, thinking about the way the shroud image came uh, came to be in the chat asked what you mean by it encodes 3d information that's a good question yeah so if you were to take a picture of me with mm -hmm. your camera it's obvious that the picture would show my white collar as white and my black jacket as black so color doesn't correspond to distance information mm -hmm. because indeed the camera is equally distant to the white as it is to the black this is not the case with the shroud the shroud is monochromatic. It's all one hue. But think of like pointillism. So think of like, imagine you had one magic marker and it's orange, let's say, and you want to give the impression of certain dark areas and certain light areas. What you do is you draw more dots in less space yeah. to give the impression yep. of um, a, a deeper, a darker hue. Mm -hmm. And then you just spread out those dots in order to give the impression of a lighter shade. And that's what you have on the shroud. So where there's contact with the cloth, um, like where the nose sticks out or the chin sticks out, it's touching the cloth in such a way that the shroud is more densely colorized here at the nose. Mm -hmm. But imagine now the Ad Adam's apple. It's going to be slightly distant to mm -hmm. the cloth because it's draped over the chin. And now that gap means that there's less colorization, less densely colorized um, hue. And this means for the scientists that there is an inverse proportion between the density of image and the distance to the camera, which in this case is the cloth. So the bottom line is that they can look at the brightness map um, of the shroud, put it through the VP8, which maps eight shades of gray, and now it's translating two-dimensional information, which is the, the cloth is 2D, obviously, or it's flat. But now if I can put it through the VP8 image analyzer, which I didn't describe, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, slide number nine. This is showing Eric Jumper and John Jackson. And uh, the instrumentation on the right is the VP8 image analyzer. This was used by NASA, by the way, to map the topography of distant planets that we didn't travel to, but we could know the hills and the valleys just by a special form of photography. Mm. And if I scroll down to the next slide, I guess this would be uh, 10, um, you can see on the right, 
um, what the VP8 image analyzer renders. Wow. Uh, obviously, there's interference because of the, the cloth and the weave and the thread, but there's the contours of a human face are clear, like the nose sticks out in such a way that corresponds to a human face. This is not the case with any other photograph. You take a picture of me, my face, mm -hmm. slip it under the VP8, my, my, my nose might go inside instead of out. Like, it makes no sense. On the shroud, however, it corresponds to the contours of a human body. And so this is what was noticed um, by these two American scientists of the United States Air Force Academy. And when they notice it, it's so mind blowing to them that this is what sparks the Shroud of Turin research project. This is why they go overseas with all that state of the art equipment. When they see that this, we can build a statue uh, based on the mathematical information that is contained in that cloth, even though there is some artistic license like for the the eyebrows and things like that. But the rest, like, for example, the, the chin is close to the sternum. Why? Because the head was hanging on the cross, right? And so if it looks like his head is raised as if like a pillow is underneath, it's not. The body is in rigor mortis and he's maintained the same position as he held oh my on, in, uh, on the cross. Likewise with the knees, like you might think, oh, there's some triangular support under the knees. No, it's just that his knees were bent on the cross. So that's and, how they were and when the, he was And that's wrapped. how they remain. Exactly. So they're going to force the hands down, obviously, um, in order to carry him from the execution site about 140 feet, if I'm not mistaken, down Calvary and into this cave, which is a, the garden. I love this, a little aspect, a little often missed. Um, but Jesus is buried in a garden and there he's laid to rest. And it's from that place that the new Eden is constructed, right? That, that Jesus is, is risen from the dead and re, in this way gives us access into Eden. So there's a little spiritual reading for you. That is remarkable. Is that an explanation for the newest objection to the authenticity about the angle the blood marks would have had to have been made from? Mm. I'm not sure what the questioner is referring to. That's, that's, that's your me. question? Yeah, oh, okay, I well then I can... A touch of... I did yeah. a touch of research to the newest objections. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are in some reconstructions that will even show the way the blood flows. Um, there's Sometimes I feel like this is exaggerated, however, because Baima Bologna is a forensic doctor in Italy. There were two in America, Heller and Adler, who studied the blood stains in, I want to say, the 1980s um, to determine certain characteristics of the blood. But Baima Bologna suggests that um, the scourge marks, and we have some 360 of them, so some 240 scourge marks on the back, oh 120 on the front, and it's every area. I just assumed that he was scourged just on the back. That's what I. But would have uh, but it's it's not. It's the, from the clavicle to the ankles, front and was back. Was Mel Gibson inspired by the shroud? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and now in some ways, however, he tells that he what's the saint that uh, Gemma or no? No, 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 no. Um, that, that has I know who you mean. These the visions, private revelations, the private revelations, and so yeah. he tells that in an interview. Someone will tell you in the live chat in three seconds, so Is you just shout it out when it's there. Catherine, Catherine yeah, and Emmerich. Emmerich. There we go. There we go. That's, That's it. Thank the one. You. And so in an interview, he says how he took inspiration from some of that, yeah. and he also also from Caravaggio paintings in some points. Now he tells you his point is to drive you over the edge emotionally. Like he wants right. to bring you to the brink of like, can you even look at this? It's, he wants that to, he wants that to be an emotive response. Um, and so he does drum up certain details. Like for example, um, Jesus carries the T cross, which would weigh something like 300 plus okay, pounds. I'm so glad you brought this up. Okay. Based on the shroud and based on what we know historically. He carried the patibulum, the cross that is only <sighs> the horizontal beam that weighs some 57 or 75 kilo. I know in pounds it's like 75 to 125 pounds is what we postulate that. But he carried it in just the same way as men who work on the railroad who carry a similar type of beam. Across their shoulders? No. Like this? Uh, uh, in favoring the right shoulder. Okay. One third of the weight would have been about in, in front of him two thirds behind and they would rest at something like this so that you have excoriation on the right shoulder. And then again on the left shoulder blade, precisely the, the scapular that sticks out. That's what's braided against, uh, as he, as he jostles his position, as he falls to the ground, a 10 centimeter square excoriation on the left shoulder blade, a little further down and closer to the spine. And so, um, I've heard that Padre Pio said that was the most painful portion of his stigmata. The the shoulder wound. Yeah. Exactly. I've heard that wow. too. Yes, I've heard that too. Now, and that was, again, as private revelation. But 
I do want to just um, sift out two kinds of things. So I think one thing is a saint's private revelation. Another thing is a historical archaeological object. And they don't necessarily coincide. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a lot of, in my mind right now, and I want to answer his question too, but <laughs> I've just got to go to the stigmata because this is a, a case in point, right? Many stigmatists have the nail wounds in the center of the palms. And yet on the shroud, it's in desktop space. I'll, I'll pull it up just so we can have a graphic that, but if you look like under the muscle in the thumb, you'll have, if you were to bend, so put your, uh, Thumb, thumb and, and pinky, pinky together, together right. bend down like 90 degrees, um, and now under the muscle in your thumb, you'll get a little divot. At least some of us have this. Okay. Do you have this? Uh, I, I've got a, I'm not sure there's the camera. Sure, I've got a, this like tendon yeah, yeah, yeah. Is right in the center. That's but where there, it goes, there's huh? a, That's where the nail went in, <sighs> and it penetrated out 1.5 centimeters higher on the opposite side. And so according to a French surgeon by the name Pierre Barbet, who writes a book called a, a doctor at Calvary, he does this experiment on fresh cadavers. Sorry for the macabre detail here a little, but it, no, let's it's, do it. it it's, it's, it's really worth just to understand like so much of my That's the kind of science I want to give my body to give, give your body yeah, to, to kind of like for science yeah, like, to was, understand more about the crucifixion. Okay. I'm glad to see you, not me. No, no, because this is bad news. Seriously. When, if, when, well, the bad news about putting the nail here is, is that there are two nerves that pass just through this spot. It's the ulnar nerve and the median nerve, mm. and they don't control. It's not just that they control the movement of your fingertips, but they're, they're sense nerves that are going to send shock waves of pain through your central nervous system. I meant once the, I'm dead. You oh, once you're dead. oh, once yeah, you're dead. Oh, once you're dead. I wasn't well, saying I want no someone use. to crucify me no, now. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I was going to think of you as a hero, but no, no, not no, you no, just no, dropped no, down no, enough. No, that's, yeah, that would have been that's an idiot. insanity. <laughs> so, so we've got really good reason to okay. think it wasn't through the palms of the hands. Right. And so this has been asked, like, Jesus, hold, if the shroud were authentic, surely we would see that the nail wounds would be in the hands. Are you going to tell me that all those stigmatists Padre Pio included go. were wrong. And and thanks be to God, it's the stigmatists, it's th themselves who answer this question, so I don't have to. Ah, good. And they and they say, look, don't think that this is how he was fast fastened historically. He must have been uh, fixed in a more permanent way. But l when you see the stigmatists, you immediately understand those are the wounds of Jesus, which is exactly the point. Like for our sake. <laughs> for understanding like if Paul, your wrists were bleeding well well paul would say is like look i bear the marks of christ right so there's this sense of there's a credibility because he is sharing he's filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of christ to use the words of colossians 1 24 right there's something like okay christ the head in heaven is glorified he's suffering no more but in his mystical body he continues to suffer how do you convey that idea if, if all of our artwork, if all of our churches have down through the centuries depicted Christ crucified with the nail ones in the hands, it's the way to communicate effectively, mm. even if it's not historically true, that those are the wounds of, that you participate in the wounds of Christ is to put the nail ones in here in the palms. But we know, and Pierre Babet tested this in the 1930s and then publishes in the 50s, if you put a nine inch nail with a square cross section through this portion of the palm after just 10 minutes and with a little shove, it comes right through what is just soft tissue. There's no transversal support here. There's no way it could sustain the weight of a human body, not even half the weight of a human body. And in fact, we know from the first century literature that you could be crucified for some two weeks and not die. Do you know that in some instances they would little variations of crucifixion could be employed. So you could like give a little sedile, a little seat, mm -hmm. so that some of the weight could be redistributed in such a way that even if the crows had come and pecked out your eyes, you're you're, you're still alive. You're not bleeding that much on the shroud. It's when they take out the nail. Now the faucet is opened. Now the blood can flow. You're not actually uh, uh, bleeding that much. Just reminded, I never can answer your question about the blood flows. And I'm getting there. So th this is important to say that even if the scourge marks aren't uh, penetrating the skin so that blood is flowing out, that's what Mel Gibson exaggerates. He uses the scorpione, like this. It's, have you remember that scene where the shells tied into the leather straps? Shells and like like bone, um, glass, shrapnel or something. Well, I don't know. Like bone, it yeah. was like metal shards that would kill you, and in short time. Um, but 
what we see on the shroud is actually much more credible. Um, we we have these uh, scourge marks. I was telling you front and back. We can even tell you the directionality with which they with which they fall. Imagine this for the con artist theory. If you look at the mid body range, all of these scourge marks land perpendicular to the main axis of the body. But if they fall towards the feet or towards the head, that is towards the extremities, it's always at an oblique angle. And we can draw the arc. So we can know that there are two lictores, two, two men scourging, one on either side of the body, pivoting from one fixed point. So we can see their half circle. We can see this arc. And, their, um, and, and that's why the patterns land as they do. But it means that one guy was evidently taller than the other because his arc was longer than the other. This was discovered in the 1980s. Like somebody's going to draw a circle around every single one of these scourge yeah, marks. You actually have that here. I'd I do, love to yeah, throw let's, that up if we can. Yeah, we definitely will. And so it's um, Monsignor Ritchie who looks at this directionality. But what mm. I was going to say is it's not sure, it's a debated point, whether these scourge marks actually penetrate the skin. So let's go to slide 22. That's the the Passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson has this very dramatic scene. I always have to pull away at this point. Like, do you remember when yeah. it like l latches onto the skin yeah. and you're like waiting for it to, I, 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 like, I can't, I can't watch that yeah. scene. It's just too much. Um, but what we see on the shroud is more like this. The very next slide, 23. 23. We have a picture of a Roman flagrum. And uh, this is that uh, the instrument of torture mm. that has three leather straps. At least that's the postulate just because um, they're, there are groups of three. At the end of these elastic leather straps, we have these lead balls mm -hmm. that are going to leave these scourge marks. And you can see this pattern, which I've created in black again and again, all over the shroud. I, I think see. it's Peter Jackson um, from Sterp that will count these and others have published on the same point to say that it's some 240 on the back and 120 on the front, which means uh, a total of 360 divided by three means 120 lashes that is three times as many as the Old Testament scriptures allow. So don't confuse a Roman scourging with a Jewish flogging. They're utterly distinct. The, uh, the Jewish flogging is in the synagogue with leather straps, and it never exceed, exceeds 39 lashes. Do you remember, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, five times I suffered the mm. 40 minus one. That was the upper limit, because you're not to treat your brother like a beast, he says, and I think he quotes Deuteronomy there. Um, and But of course, they, they have no concern. This, we're not in the synagogue. We're not using a Jewish flog. This is the Roman flagrum. And each one of these marks is the equivalent of a third degree burn as far as the damage that it does to the human body, um, even if it doesn't perforate the skin. So look, you could fall off a motorbike and be six weeks laid up in a hospital Maybe you didn't shed a drop of blood, but it's no less painful. And as far as your circulatory system is concerned, that is blood loss, even if it's a hemorrhage under the surface of the skin. So if you look at some hyper-realistic uh, versions of the Man of the Shroud, they'll show um, blood stains, like each one of these oozing blood. Each one, and, and that may be a little much. It may be the case. It may not be the case. But this uh, Baima Bologna argues that this is what's called ecchymosis, that is like a, um, what do you call that? A cardenal in Spanish? A bruise, a bruise, like a, where it gets um, a di a discolored on the surface of the skin, even if it doesn't perforate the skin. In any case, I was going about the directionality. There's definitely in the crown of thorns, right? Yeah, the crown is in the, in, in the vertical position. Okay. And so it's, it's now accumulating. This, you have this cap of thorns. Do we it's, have an image of that? Oh, yeah. Let's look at that. That's important. Okay. So that's going to be right before. Uh is what? that the same one that's in Notre Dame? Notre Dame in Paris? Yeah. It's a Saint Chapelle, actually, is the, uh, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, oh Saint. My, here we go. Yeah, here we go. This is going to be, okay, tell you what, go to um, 26. The, uh, it, this is just a picture that shows how we've often imagined the crown of thorns as a wreath. 26? Yeah, 20. Oh, sorry, it is 27. Yep. Yeah, 27. Um, but, Again and again, we've seen pictures like these, where there's like a circle, a, yeah. uh, a circlet that um, that goes around the ears, leaving the top of the head exposed. Um, and if you were a con artist trying to convince people that this is Jesus, you'd be inclined to do something like this on the shroud. But in this case, the shroud dares to deviate from the sacred norm here. Mm -hmm. It gives us instead a cap of thorns. So just go to the very next slide, and what we see is that. 
it covers every area of the head. Um, wow. So we have some 30 to 50 puncture wounds that have little rivulets of blood. If you scroll down to slide tw uh, 29, Ooh. some have reconstructed um, what they think the, the the cap of thorns would look like using the Zisophus spina Christi. That's the uh, species of plant that has these thorns that are three quarters of an inch long. The very Latin name. How it's, difficult would that have been to make? Well, th there are different versions of this that look like somebody spent three hours like weaving. <laughs> sure. a thing, and I'm not convinced that a Roman centurion is going to make this beautiful <laughs> braid before he like puts it yes. neatly on Jesus' head. So I think it's much more likely that he just kind of lopped off a mess of thorn, okay. took a pliant branch or wicker that you see here in the slide 29, and then bound together that mess of thorn. And then with his spear and sword, just pressed it on his head. And so these thorns, although um, supple when green, when they dry, they're like nails that just pierce through the skin. And so that's what the helmet looks like. It's interesting that the Greek word for crown is Stephanos. So if you have any friends named Stephen, you know what that comes from. It's mm -hmm. crown. Um, but the crown in the first century and in the literature that we get in the, also in the Old Testament, of course, is going to be translated into the Greek as well in the Septuagint. The Stephanos was what was on the head of the priest. And what did the priest's crown look like? Well, we can read about that. I think it's in Exodus the, towards the end. You're going to see how it's covering the entire head. And so even though in the Middle Ages, our crowns, sure, they were, you know, these circles around like a ring yeah. on top of the head. In the first century, you could well imagine that something like that would be called a crown. Um, and so what I go to in the next slide, if you see it's slide 30, um, these are just pictures. Now the intensity has, the contrast has been turned up to see these blood stains at the nape of the neck. So of course the, the suppliant branch is going to get, it's, there's going to be this pooling effect as the blood drips down from the head, according to gravity, it's going to now drip down the back of the neck. And so this is what you see these kind of like, see how, um, mm. the, it's flowing down and in, in towards the center. So that is an area where you would have expected a great accumulation of blood. And, and so it is that you see that on the shroud. Some have said, and I, I, uh, I wish I could see exactly that at the shoulder, that there is evidence of a blood stain that goes in the opposite direction. So some have said, suggested that when he was scourged, he was leaning over such that blood could flow. What it looks like it's flowing Around. up, but mm. because of his position at the time, it's actually flowing down. Um, that is one thing I'm, I'm not sure. I just, I know that the bit about blood flowing from the scourge wounds is contested. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to see further details about that. But I think this is so um, hard to reproduce, um, especially at the wrist, the blood, the flow of blood. Should we look and, at that next? Yeah, so let's, let's look at that because this, um, I want to go to way down to the point of crucifixion where we see the wounds in the hands. And I, I must have gone past it. Um, because this is his death. Here we go. Yeah, so there's a bifurcation in the blood stain here. I'm looking at slide. Does that say 39? 39. 39. So, uh, of course, Jesus is hanging from the cross. So when he's on the ground, he would be at a 90 degree angle. Um, and I'll tell you what, let's, let, me, let me go through the whole process for you. Go to slide number 37. And so the stipes, like that's the, um, the, the vertical beam, it's already planted in the ground okay. ready to, cause this is the execution site. This is Mount Calvary. And they were ready to receive the, those who would be put to death. And so what you were carrying had pre-established holes mm. and it had a fixture to receive the, the patibulum, the horizontal beam. And so all the centurion had to do is lay the victim out flat, stretch out his hands, um, 90 degrees to his body take a nine inch nail in, in one hand, a hammer in the other, you know, drive it into the wrist and it would go through the hole and now fix him, his, his hand to, to the cross. He'd get to the other side and he'd have to make the wrist line up with a pre-established hole. If it doesn't reach, he makes it reach by, by dislocating the shoulder and then driving in the nail. And so, um, that is what some have suggested about the man of the shroud, a dislocated shoulder. And then he's made to stand up in the, um, the vertical position. And we seldom think about this transition, don't we? So two men yeah. would, would uh, grab 
either end. What number is that? This is a uh, 38. 38. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yeah, and so he's uh, he's now hoisted up and plopped down on the vertical piece, and now he hangs from 90 degrees. He sags 25 degrees, and for at least a moment, all of the weight of his body is hanging on those two nails in his hands. Um, and it's only when they put a nail in his feet that they can redistribute the weight. But let me look to slide 39 because this is what shows how there's a blood how there's a blood flow from the wrist and there's a bifurcation pattern here of about five to seven degrees and this is very strange like why do we have two flows of blood and the answer is that in this position you can't breathe out what you need to do because what's happening is as you're as you're in this position your pleural cavity, so you have this pleura, is this double membrane that envelops your lungs, and it fills with body fluid as you slowly asphyxiate. Now, you would asphyxiate quite quickly if your hands were together. Do you know that the Nazis knew this? To, to, if you, you want to hang someone from the rafters and kill them quickly, just hang them with your hands together, and that stretches out these intercostal muscles, the, the muscles that control your breathing between the ribs, and you can't exhale. This is why the victims start kicking the air so that they spontaneously they want to, to breathe. They, they can't help it. Um, but of course, when you're on the cross, this is a debilitating factor, if not a cause of death, because now the hands are spread out. And so you last longer. It's, they were protracting on purpose your agony um, by giving you, uh, you know, a nail in your feet that actually allows you to sustain, sustain the weight of your body. Now you can press down on the nail in your feet, pull and twist on the nail in your hands, kind of throw out your hip in such a way that now your muscles can relax and you can breathe out at last. But you can't hold that position for any length of time. And so when you're, you know, your muscles are on fire, you collapse again until you can't stand it anymore and you have to push up. And now you're, so what I'm trying to suggest is that there are two positions of your hands. Even though there's an ulnar nerve and, mulnar, and the median nerve that I told you are when exposed in World War II, there were soldiers who had a median nerve exposed, and if they didn't get morphine, some preferred to commit suicide than to endure the excruciating pain. And that is, by the way, the exact word for this. Do you know that the word excruciating comes from excruciatus, out of the cross, in other words, that's the root, the crux. Wow. The, so th this was a pain that is so unique, it gets its own word. It was engineered to be the sumum supplicium. That's what the Romans thought the cross to be, the highest of all punishments. They were going to put you on display in a prominent area where there were passersby all the time. So as to say, don't do what this guy did or get ready to suffer the same. And so he would be agonizing in front of your eyes. And in this way, uh, if that were me, I wouldn't want to budge it a millimeter. But you have to, to breathe. You can't help it. So it's these self-inflicted pains as he's going up and down. Can you imagine, if that's what it is to breathe, what is it to speak? Like I always I thought, like, I, I, mm -hmm. this is what helps me about the shroud, actually. It's like, it's not because I have some morbid fixation with pain or like blood and guts and things. I don't, believe me. Um, but this is the most radical love the world has ever known, right? To steal an expression from uh, Pope Ratzinger. J Joseph Ratzinger said that before he was Pope, I think. Um, but this is divine love on display in a language that is appropriate for, like when you translate divine love into human language, words just won't do. Um, this is Jesus stretching his, out, his hands wide on the cross as if to say, this is how much I love you. And he stretches out his arms and he dies. Um, but mm. if it, it, to speak, you know, like there he is praying for his persecutors when um, he's feeling this. He's saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. There's a little detail that I've, I've got to throw this in there. This is the Bible nerd coming out of me. But Please. Uh, do you know that when we studied this part uh, where Luke quotes um, the Psalms, where Jesus from the cross quotes uh, that Psalm that says, into your hands, I commend my spirit. He says, Father, forgive me. Um, above all, Father, forgive me. It's introduced with not the verb he said in the simple past, but instead elegan means he was saying. It's an imperfect, and it suggests that perhaps that he was repeating this like a refrain in a song. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You know, giving for, giving to us uh, an excuse for, for what we're doing. I wonder if we're worthy of that excuse, by the way, but there he was praying for us anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think this is why I've come to love the shroud is that I really think it draws me 
you know, I've seen enough crucifixes to be inured to it, to be desensitized yeah. to it. It's jewelry, it's decoration for my living room, you know, and I can sip tea as I look at, at the cross. But this shakes me out of my complacence and says, you know, look at what I suffered for you. This, look at my disfigured face. Um, this is what I endured for your sins, Andrew, to say, and not just mine and not just those sins from today, but he's taking upon himself all sins from the dawn of time to the end of the age. And this is the bitter cup that he's drinking to the dregs. And look at what it looks like. You know, when he could have snapped his finger or like waved a wand and said, you know, abracadabra, I save you, you know, mm. suffer a paper cut or something, right? Mm. But why this? And yet, and he would say in, in John 10, verse 18, he says, mm, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I've got the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. So he's got the power to, to endure anything and he's showing it in this way. He's stepping into a very unique set of sufferings and he knows it and he says, amen anyway. Like why, why in the world would you do that? I, I don't know, no human, no matter how heroic that would step into such a thing. And yet there he is doing it for us. Do you know what really, can I insert a something? I, I know you probably have uh, comments too, but this, uh, this took me like a year and a half of studying the shroud to for have this dawn upon me, its significance, but I needed the help of the shroud. It's the agony in the garden. Jesus says three times, let this cup pass from me. Um, but then of course he adds, not my will, but yours be done. Do you remember that the, the detail that only Luke gives us? Mm -hmm. It's that he's the doctor and the doctor is going to say, do you remember? He sweated blood. He, yes. Here's how he puts it. He was in such agony and he prayed so fervently that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Do you know, you can read peer reviewed scientific journal articles on a phenomenon called hematidrosis. Mm -hmm. This is when your subcutaneous capillaries become distended and burst, not because anybody's beating up on you, but simply because the fear of death, the, the, the idea that what he was about to face is, is present to him such that his blood vessels explode. This is the, the hemorrhage underneath the surface of the skin that now exits out of the adjacent uh, sweat pores, creating little drops of red uh, blood on the surface of the skin, leaving the biggest organ in your body sensitive to touch in a new way. So that even if you blow air over the surface of the skin, like just <sighs> after having suffered hematidrosis, that would register in your body as physical pain. And so that is the preambles. That's before we've even begun the physical sufferings. And so I always ask this question, what's the first physical violence that men did to Jesus that night of his passion? And it occurs to me that after that prayer, after that suffering of his sweating blood, the it's, it's when Jesus hears the sounds of those bearing torches and clubs and they're crying out his name. And he says, if it's Jesus you seek, it is I, you know, I am, uh, ego ami. And Judas comes close and with a big smile and a nonchalance that is chilling would say, hail rabbi. But literally the word is rejoice. How ironic is that? Because with a kiss now and with a big smile, he says, hail rabbi. But with that kiss says, I hope you die. Right? Because that's the first, that's the first domino to fall. It's going to begin a chain of events, dominoes that culminate in crucifixion. But it was that kiss that registered in his body as physical pain because of the hematidrosis. And that's highly appropriate. Go check out Psalm 55 because we read this as priests often on Fridays um, in the liturgy of the hours. But it says something like this. Had my enemy betrayed me, mm -hmm. I could bear his taunts. But it was you, my intimate friend, my close companion. You know, his words are like butter, mm -hmm. I think it says. You know, but it the, the, pierced like javelins. Yes, exactly. And that's what was happening to Jesus. His intimate friend gave him a greater suffering than Pontius Pilate when he kissed him. And when he kissed him because, the, it, you know, we, we peg that on Pontius Pilate, poor guy. There's only five guys in our, in our creed, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I think the Blessed Virgin Mary gets it in there. The other one who gets mentioned is this Pontius Pilate, this procurator. Why? Because it's a peg in history for the mm -hmm. one. On the one hand, he's, he's going to say, look, I find no cause in him. I don't want to put him to death. So why does he? Well, because there's a mob outside pumping their fists in there saying, crucify and crucify him. And they're the ones saying, look, because of his blasphemy, 
That's why he's got to be put to the cross. It wasn't because he was an insurrectionist. It wasn't because he didn't pay the temple tax because he claimed to be the Messiah and the son of God. And that the Sanhedrin cannot abide. You know, Caiaphas rends his garments and says, you've heard the blasphemy from his own lips. Go and cart him off to Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate says, look, I wash my hands. I don't want anything to do with this. It's on you, not me. Of course, he gives the green light. But when he does, he puts this sign, you know, Jesus, King of the Jews. What I've written, I have written. And so it went down in history that Jesus went to the cross with the cause of his, of his death. Because that's the titulus was supposed to be what incriminated you. You know, this is why you're here. Well, in history, it was went down in history because I am the, I, I, Jesus, Jesus will say, I am the king of the Jews. He would also say, I am, I, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, you know, my angels, God, mm-hmm. I could snap my finger. I could just call out with a word and, you know, the father would send 12 legions of angels. Jesus could add a thought, just make all the, that wood of the cross, those nails just dissolve in thin air, but he doesn't, he endures it on purpose. And to show us, to show us his love. I think I want to say this, that, you know, Shakespeare has a poem that we would memorize in high school and it's a love poem. It's a sonnet. I'm going to forget the number, but it, it ends like this. It says, Shakespeare says, doubt that the stars are fires, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar but never doubt I love. And as beautiful as those words are, I'm sure many, uh, many a young lady has swooned to hear something like that. The fact is they are just words. And so Jesus is interesting, right? In the scriptures, it's not full of, I love you, I love you, I love you. But what he does is show it. And he shows it in such a way that we can't possibly doubt. Because, I mean, think of those who love you most. Who has ever endured anything like this? Jesus is going to take the full brunt of our sin and shame and dies the most ignominious death imaginable. And from that place shows us that he loved us in a way that is like no other. And uh, I think that's why we need to contemplate the cross. I don't end the shroud. I don't think it's extra. I think we need, there's a contemplation here that says, if you want to go deep into my heart, if you want to grow in holiness, I'm going to steal a, word, a line from uh, Pope St. Bon, Pope St. John Paul II's crossing the threshold of hope, where he says, there is no Christian holiness without devotion to the passion. Just like there is no Christian holiness um, without, without um, the contemplation of the cross or something to that effect. But the bottom line is that this isn't, this isn't just decoration for our living room. Like we need to <coughs> meditate on this stuff. And that's what I would invite people to do, because no matter how much we talk, we'll never do it. We'll just scratch the surface. But the heavy lifting has to happen in silence, where we look to that face, when we look to that body, and then we ask, who are you, Jesus? Why did you take all this upon yourself? Why? How much do you love me? I feel moved by the Holy Spirit, I think, um, to say that there are people watching right now who want to give their life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> They haven't up until this point. They've kept God yeah. or Christianity up on the chalkboard and they've been yeah. looking at arguments for and against. Would you please right. lead them in it's a prayer beautiful. to accept the person of Jesus Christ <laughs> as their savior? I would, yeah. Praise God. Lord Jesus, uh, we call upon your holy name. There you told us wherever two or three are gathered in your holy name, there you are in our midst. And so, Lord, for sure, we're gathered together um, by the dozens, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands. And we call upon your name in praise, in worship, and we call upon your blessing. We just wanted to say, Lord, thank you for enduring the cross. Thank you for showing just how much you loved us, that you took on a mortal nature. You took on our human nature in order to, 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 to die, to save us out, to bring us out of hell and into the dominion of, mm. of Christ the King. And so Christ the King, we come before you, before your throne, and we ask that you be enthroned in our hearts now. Mm because yes, you are Lord. king of heaven and earth. You have, you take up your throne in my heart so that you can rule in my words, in my yes, gestures, Jesus. in all, all my deeds, um, because I want you to reign as king. I want your glory to shine through my broken humanity and perfect as it may be to make manifest your love on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, okay. Let's see. I've got, a ton of questions. <laughs> uh, I saw one really good one. Please. You want to go with that? Yeah. Um, somebody asked Father if Thank there were you, similarities between the Shroud of Turin and the Tilma of yeah. 
Juan. Of Guadalupe. Or, yeah, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah, there have been studies on that, in fact, Here's in the, Rome. If you don't mind, I'd like Go to read it. it just because this person, even though they're a local supporter, also gave me a $20 tip to wow. read this. So That's thank nice. you, Emilio. It's very kind of you. Have there been any comparisons between the Shroud and St. Juan Diego's Tilma with the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe? I have heard that the image is also incredibly thin on the Tilma, and I was wondering if there is any similarities. Yeah, some have noticed these similarities, especially at the face and the hands, because if you remember there, you have the Virgin who's wearing clothes. Mm. So there are aspects that have said to be parallel or similar, analogous in some way, so much so that there was a Congress in Rome at one point um, that brought some, um, some researchers together, and it was called the Two Linens, and, um, and they were highlighting some of these aspects. Now, I have to be fair, there is not nearly the same level of research done on the Tilma mm -hmm. as on the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it remains to be seen just to, to what extent this is the case. But um, we can see certain certain things that seem to be similar. Certainly many have, there's surprising aspects on the Tilma. I'm not an expert in that, so I don't want to speak to that. And I'll leave that to others. I, I know this, that the, the Tilma has been treated, has been painted. So for example, a certain rays around the angel, around the, 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 the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary that have clearly been add-ons. Um, and so um, layers of protection um, have called into question whether it's even possible to test the tilma in mm -hmm. the same way or to the same degree as we've done on the shroud. And so while that is a wish, it remains in the future. Uh, we can't say uh, definitively that these that these characteristics are the same, but that it, some have suggested that we have kind of photonegative quality or three-dimensional qualities. I, I don't want to speak uh, dogmatically about that, but I do think it's interesting that obviously, I mean, how many people have, have converted through um, that tilma, through the miracle um, that we celebrate there in December. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, I mean, upon the millions we're yeah. talking, like more than we lost in the Protestant Reformation have come back to the faith through Our Lady there in Mexico. <laughs> go so, Mary. Go Mary, exactly. Um, but um, that, oh, oh, what was I going to say? I think I just lost my train of thought. If it comes to me, I'll let you know. Yeah, no worries. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, Lucy845 says, does the back of the shroud show, show that his back bones were exposed? The back, oh, the dorsal image, in other words, on the right side, does it show that his backbone are exposed? No, it does not. Uh, so some have suggested that there is, what do they call this, like volumetric information? I should say, uh, on the shroud, I'll explain. Um, so there are two theories from the physicists about how the image was impressed upon the cloth, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Um, but one is that light emanated out of the body in the moment of the resurrection, and that light produced what we now see on the shroud. The other theory is that the cloth collapsed into the body as the body became mechanically transparent. That's the word that they use. That is to say, like, um, like a window pane is transplanted and light mm -hmm. passes through. Well, so the cloth passed through the body both on the top and on the back. That is, I know, very hard to imagine, but that's that's what some have suggested, that almost like a vacuum is created in the moment of resurrection so that the the, the cloth, both on the top and on the bottom, is like sucked into the body. Hmm. And, and that in that process, as it penetrates some four centimeters in towards the body, it actually captures three-dimensional information. I'm not going to weigh in on that. I just want to let people know that these are two theories that are out there and that um, if that's the case, we may have even uh, information that goes into the body. But um, no, I don't think we can say that we like we have exposed like vertebra. No, that that I've never heard um, defended in, in, in a way that scientists have picked up on anyway. Kyle Whittington says, I've heard that the blood samples are all AB, though I've conflicting claims on whether it's positive or negative. Has the blood type been tested and how accurate can that test be after 2000 years? Good question. And that's exactly right. Some have weighed in to say, yes, it is AB. And some have gone, in other words, some uh, tests have been done on the blood. I think <laughs> I mentioned Heller and Adler in the United States and Baima Bologna in, in Italy. And um, others have, have written on this subject. Some assert more than others, as is often the case in any area of science, yeah. right? And so uh, a certain immunologist by the name of Dr. Kelly Kurse, um, he teaches for our program. And I think he rightly 
cautions us uh, to, to say, um, look, if we want to be really, really precise of what could be the case, we could even include certain primates at, at certain tests. Like it would include humans and certain other primates fall into that same class. He's not suggesting that mm-hmm. the blood is that of a monkey or something like that. He's <laughs> simply saying that further tests would need to be done in order to pinpoint precisely human blood and then go on to do its blood type. Um, it is interesting that on the Sudarium and in other Eucharistic miracles, we've seen the blood type to be AB. So if it's, if these uh, certain scientists are right, who have gone out on a limb perhaps to, to say that there are, there's evidence enough to be AB blood, I do find it fascinating that we have these, you know, we can compare and contrast with these other samples. Of course, we do, you know, the best thing would be to just knock on a door in Jerusalem and be like, hey, uh, where's the file on, on Jesus? I want to go to the hospital and <laughs> retrieve his, his blood sample. We obviously don't have that, right? So what's the next best thing? It seems to me the Sudarium and Eucharistic miracles. But I, I understand if certain people are going to discard those other things and not, not 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 hold that. Let me ask you what what are some things that proponents of the shroud are saying that you wish they would stop saying? <laughs> like I could imagine, you know, whenever like you yeah. know, very enthusiastic religious people get together, they start drawing things out that aren't there at all, and they might make Thank these you scientific for that question. studies oh. look. Yes, no, I, we get that a lot, and in fact, like was Trump twenty twenty four somehow that was there. in that the fibers? That, that, however, that was there. Is there. Yes, I yes. See. Okay, but so I'm glad things. we cleared that up. No, <laughs> <laughs> but Q, the, Q's signature was in there. It said, "Trust the plan." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. In fact, there's some really funny pictures. Of, have you ever heard of paridolia? This is what when you look to a cloud or like a grilled cheese sandwich or like a, a root with a. Uh, like gnarly roots on a tree, okay. um, people see faces, sure. Mickey Mouse is in the clouds or words. Um, Elvis in that potato chip. Yes. Well, that was real. But that that, was, that yeah. was real. But this, so, but do the test now on religious people. Tell people, like crumple up a sheet of paper, give it to religious people and then, to, and then tell them, this is an ancient uh, papyrus. Um, what do you see? And it's exponential how much more they see in that instance. Yeah. And so people have seen sailing ships. They have seen flowers. They have seen um, rope. Um, they have seen w- words like lamb uh, um, and other names for Jesus. And I'm very skeptical of these things, knowing that paridolia is out there. And so one of the one of the things to question, it may or may not be the case, huh? Um, coins. Some have suggested that there are coins over the eyes. And um, there's a certain priest by the name of Phylas, F-I-L-A-S, who, who proposed this. But if you zoom in, you could actually see letters which look hmm. like, if I remember, U-C-A-I. This uh, is supposed to correspond to what would be U-K or Kappa A-I, because on the lepton, there's a a coin that was minted in 29 AD that has uh, like a scepter or ladle on it. And it has um, the, the inscription of Pontius Pilate or excuse me, Ty- Tiberius Caesar is the name. So it's the end of Tiberius mm-hmm. um, uh, Caesarus or something like that, um, that is, is seen on this, uh, this small little coin. And there was a problem with the theory is that it was misspelled. So, it was a C instead of a K or mm-hmm. vice versa. Yeah, C instead of a K. And and yet there it was, the misspelling. But then after the fact, they found the coin with the so-called misspelling further uh, corroborating the theory that this coin was indeed over the eyes. Um, I don't say this because I think it definitive. I do think it's interesting and it's worth further study. But so, if it's the case that we have a coin that is indeed f- minted in the year 29, that is a nice peg to put it in the first century. But because the weave is, you're, you're going to have interference on the image because, you know, the weave, when you're going on the loom over and under these threads, mm. it's not a perfectly flat piece of paper that we're projecting upon. And so is it possible to really see the edge of a letter, like the letter U on a, bl- so or might we be seeing what we want to see? Knowing that pareidolia is a phenomenon, we have to be very careful. What we don't want to do is do such sloppy science that the debunkers can easily say, look, if that's the kind of science you're doing, let's throw the whole thing out. And they throw the baby out with the bathwater. So what I want to do is, and this is what I think the Othonia 
exhibit does well, and I think the postgraduate certificate was careful to do from the start, is like, we need to do a kind of curating of the data that's out there. Let the physicists speak about physics. Let the chemists speak about chemistry. Let the image experts, you know, talk about that area, the historians, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can bring together all of this data and make it available to a broad audience that gets scrutinized so that we can know like with what degree of certainty these things are. You know what a good resource is that you can find also at Amazon? Um, John Jackson has, a, he's the physicist or yeah, physicist from the Shroud of Turn Research Project. And he, uh, for like 20 something bucks, you can get a summary of like the main conclusions and the source material that is referenced so that in, in like a hundred pages, you can get a lot of the data mm. on the shroud. That's I was going to ask you that. What's the single best book you would recommend a yeah, layman read? That's a good one. That's a good one for um, learning about STIRP. The thing is the shroud is a universe. Like it is, depends what, what type yeah. of science you want to know about. Yeah. Cause it's, if you want to know like about coming at Mount Everest, like how do I exactly do I approach this? Exactly. Thing? Which is why we wanted to create the diploma so that uh. we could give you a panoramic view to the one who's being introduced, but in such a way that is pedagogical and that it doesn't fixate on the minutia, you know, major on the minors without even getting, because it's so, to my mind, a good example of this is the carbon dating. How many of these documentaries spend long hours talking about something that in the end tells us nothing mm -hmm. about the actual shroud yeah. and leaves out all this other stuff. Yeah. So if you're talking about forensic doc, if forensic medicine, I think you've got to know Pierre Barbet, I mentioned, a doctor at Calvary. It's been translated into every language. Uh, Zugaby is a modern uh, forensic doctor that kind of follows up, but it's, some have called it like footnotes on Barbet. Um, but then there's the whole area of like what the popes have said, how tradition has received it, how historians, mm. right? So, you know, it's a good podcast by my friend, Dr. Cheryl White and Father Peter Mangum from L from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. They do a great job. They have a beautiful exhibit, one of the biggest in the United States, by the way. Um, and But they have a podcast with a little, if you want to go deeper into some of this stuff, it's a nice introduction anyway into the shroud. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kay Silla says, I saw a television special about the true face of Jesus that reconstructed mm. what Jesus may have looked like based right. on the shroud and also went into a lot of the recent science Father is discussing here. Is he familiar with the program? And if so, what's his opinion? It was a big part of what brought me back from faith deconstruction slash postmodernism and solidified my mum's and my faith in the re in the resurrection. Yeah, I, well, I think I've seen that. Uh, what's the name of it again? A true, f it was the, the face thing? Uh, let me find it. Uh, because the true face of Jesus. The Face. Maybe we could look that up to see if it's. Uh, I, I want to say if it's Robert Downing uh, or something like that mm -hmm. is the the name of the guy. Uh, I, I might be wrong about the name, but if if I if I remember, he's not a, a Christian. He's kind of like a Gnostic, okay. but he's really good about the technology. So at that point, anyway, he had made one of the most hyper realistic reconstructions mm. of the face, uh, taking the shroud as his starting point. He's going to try to um, reduce the noise, like all the interference that comes from the weave just to give you the face as face. But he was really fixated on the physicality of it. And so he uses, uh, you find it? Sorry, I found all of the things in the History Channel. Except for who <laughs> oh, okay. Well, he, yeah, so he, that's probably the one. It it, it made a big splash when, mm -hmm. it, when it came out. And um, we met at the... Uh, Museum of the Bible. Yeah, so Ray about, Downing, sorry. Was it, was it Ray? Ray? That's Downing. it. Ray Downing. Nice guy. I like him quite a lot, I have, to, I have to say. We went out for dinner after the fact, but we met at the Museum of the Bible two years ago when there was a, um exhibition there, a temporary exhibit. So say a little prayer. We need a national museum here mm. in the United States, and uh, maybe, we, maybe you can work on that. In fact, there's a, a, a filmmaker by the name of uh, Robert Orlando that is, is making uh, some material now. I hope it, it gets it makes a big splash, um, and I hope it does a good job. I've not seen it yet, but he's bringing in some major scholars like Ben Witherington III and Dale Allison, ma major Matthean exegete Mark Goodacre. Um, so, gosh, I hope... I. I hope it's okay that I'm saying, oh, I know it is okay, actually, because it's online. So I saw publicity um, of his of his film, so I know it's safe to say that. Um, but, and he interviewed me just, what, two days ago in Houston. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm i hopeful that it's going to be awesome, and uh, that'll get the word out even, even further. But there are people that come from different vantage points, and Ray Downing is certainly one of them. He's not a, a Christian, he's not, pro but he has a certain devotion. Um, there's, I think Ray, what did I say? Ray, uh, Barry Schwartz mm -hmm. is a good example. Barry wears 
uh, an image of the man of the shroud on a necklace around uh, around his neck every single day. He says this this man is an image of of charity, is an example of what uh, heroism looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, he's not a believer, or uh, maybe not, not all the way, not yet. But we 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 can pray for that too. Yeah, by the way, um, and um, yeah, uh, I love that. So I think it's worth knowing that people like Ray give us good help into visualizing the image, yeah, yeah. even if they're not, um, you know, the best go-to for Orthodox uh, theology. <laughs> sure, sure. sure. Uh, Doc Forte says, given that tests of the shroud since the 2000s, Raymond FTIR, Flax, have conclusively shown an origin around the first century AD. Are you surprised that more modern apologists don't bring it up when debating atheist religious skeptics who argue that Jesus did not exist? I, I didn't get the part about the book. I don't fully bo- understand it either. Uh, given that time. tests on the shroud since the 2000s, and then he's given three examples, have conclusively shown an origin around the first century no, AD. But that's not the case. Not the case. We, we don't have definitive proof that the shroud is from the first century. Okay. Um, it's an open question. Remember, I think might have been people might have been confused to say, in 1988, they, they proved supposedly that it's from the 13th century. And then okay. that will, since the 2000s, um, we proved that that conclusion was false. But that only means that we don't know when the shroud is dated to. It doesn't prove that the shroud is from the first century. We would need to do a further test to determine that. Okay. There's someone knocking on a door and it might be the mailman or it might be my kid. But either way, given enough time, they will leave. <laughs> it's a weird knock. I know, no, I know nobody on the live stream can hear this because I'm watching the audio levels to make sure, but it is like <laughs> oh, okay. they are starting purposely very soft and then crescendoing and wow. stopping every... And they're still going. They're still going. Sound like a, ha- a distant hammer. Should oh. I check? I mean, we're live. They can... Do you want to check? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Just shout at them for me. Yeah. Just say, Matt said you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> no, it's probably my kid. Nice job not hitting the camera. A lot of people do that. It's very frustrating. Um, I, Liam, never mind. Liam did text me and ask where you were, and I was like, <laughs> "Dude, did you even bother to check the one thing he would be doing?" <laughs> um, let's see. I, this person says, "Anyone else super emotional listening to this?" Amen. Somebody asked a really interesting question that yeah. I don't know if Father will have the answer to. No one there. Oh, yeah, we have someone working on the roof. I bet that's what it is. Oh, there you go. Distant hammer. But I'm glad to he- I'm glad to know that they can't hear it. Um, somebody asked... Thank you. ...if you had done any research into orthodox icons that appear to not be painted by humans. Mm. I have no idea what they're talking about. Yeah, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about what's called the akirapoyeta. So in Greek, oh, there's a you word... Spell that? Nope. Yeah, so it's just from the word <laughs> it's just from the word heros, which is hand, and it mean and the ah is the alpha privative, so it's like not made by human hands. It's the verb yeah. to make. The, the word like hand with English then, letters. <laughs> oh, so uh, English transliteration would be something like a c h e i r o p o i e t a. I think. It's, can't pronounce it. <laughs> so, but there are these images that uh, are called the not made with human hands um, because they're following a prototype, which is understood to be not made with human hands. So the theory actually goes that because there are some 250 points of coincidence between these images. So if you go into the courtroom and let's say I want to commit, I want to accuse you of a heinous crime, like mm-hmm you stole my relic in Rome and you go like off to the Bahamas or something and I need to make up an image of you and hold you accountable in mm-hmm. court. Mm-hmm. My drawing better match up to your real face mm-hmm. by 50 points of coincidence. But we have some 250 points of coincidence between some of these icons and the shroud itself. And they're really counterintuitive artistic traits. Like for example, there's a U between the eyebrows in many icons. There's a there's a, a horizontal line that cuts across the throat or like bulging eyebrows I told you about or, or you know, accentuated cheeks, swollen cheeks. Um, my favorite one though is together, the, the mop of hair. You know, it's like, why does Jesus always have to have this massive hairdo? Yeah. Like why, why not 
why doesn't somebody do something different? And, and, or the best is the wisp of hair, like yeah. right here at the center. Yeah. And of could, course, could we maybe pull up these icons while bet. we're talking about this? That might yeah. be helpful. To find them I've got some here. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah. We have some on a slide. But while we're looking for that, I just want to ask people, if you think that this interview is helpful and would be helpful to the faith of others, please consider sharing it on Facebook or Twitter or just tell your mother-in-law about it or your son about it. Or let's let's spread the word because I think this is really powerful. Yeah, I'm trying to find the picture, but um, I'm sure there's... And well, there's there's several different uh, icons. I mentioned earlier the Pantocrator of uh, Mount Sinai, um, St. Catherine's. That is one of the most ancient. Um, but, oh gosh, I can't believe I don't have this in here. I definitely have the slides. Oh, yeah, it's right at the beginning. I have three of them anyway. Um, so what slide number is it? Eight. Eight. Yeah, so there is St. Catherine's on the far left. Um, I want to say this is Chefalu on the far right. I think this one in the middle is um, from the 12th century, and I can't remember where it's from, but I have the notes on it <clears throat> elsewhere. But it's just a good example of just how in different places and in different times, again and again, now these you have some of these are, are mosaics or paintings, but we could multiply this by five. Mm -hmm. And if you go to an Othoni exhibit, you'll see the shroud in the center and you'll have like nine images all around the side. And this is one of the things that was um, studied very early on. I want to say it's Paul Vignon who um, enumerates something like 13 to 15 characteristics wow. here, but um, that are again and again the same. Like look for example. See so you the, think this is all inspired by the shroud and the headpiece? Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly the theory. Is that, in other words, they're looking at the shroud and because this is a divine prototype, they can't diverge. They can't do something different. They're going to, they'll open the eyes. Um, so of course on the shroud, we have uh, closed eyes uh, and it's a river. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but these, they are painted by humans, but they're just like making as faithful replicas of the shroud as possible. Exactly. So it's okay. not that um, they're divine. They're, they're, like there's other that are miraculous yeah. images, exactly. But they're called this because they're following the Akira Poyata. And so it, there's a similar, I think, mindset as you get with re, like paintings of the shroud. People, re, like they said that we have reconstructions of the shroud in painting format and it's like signed like we have documentation saying and they would sanctify the uh, the new shroud by placing it on the old shroud and so by placing it into context it's kind of like the idea with relics you know it's like okay this uh, this glove it's not padre pio yeah. but it touched padre pio yeah, yeah, yeah. and so we hold on to it as a third class relic yeah. okay so something similar with the shroud it, it, the shroud was seen as like the archetype and then the, by association these others these other images whether icons that were painted or mosaics or other cloths that were then going to be uh, draped in in other chapels elsewhere um, they would they would be uh, holy because of their coming into contact with the shroud very good. All right. My goodness. So many questions coming in. Um, what do you mean when you say anatomic perfection? You've said that several times. Yeah. So this was one of the first things to be noticed. Like um, one thing that artists will do when they want to draw the human body mm -hmm. is study the proportions of the head, for example, how, what, what is the unit? The head is like one eighth of the total um, height of the man mm -hmm. or the distance between the eyes yeah. but the, as related to the tip of the nose okay. or to the extremes of the mouth or the distance to the ears. Um, and so models, and this go all the way back to the Greeks about like, what are the proper proportions so that when we make statues and draw pictures, we do so according to um, the like real human body. It's not a cartoonish drawing. Um, you you got to ask like, who in the 13th century was doing anything remotely close? Like not even in impressionism centuries later, were we doing something like photonegativity, mm -hmm. but then photonegativity with hyperrealism, like Mm -hmm. No, that, that's what I'm trying to say. Is that, so the, the, um, when they were looking at basically measurements of the body on, on the one hand, that is that, that they're the right proportion of the different individual elements to the whole. 
at the micro level and at the macro level, and then also with regard to pathologies above all. So, uh, for example, um, the the side of the uh, chest is is perforated. So we have um, a four centimeter um, double edged blade that leaves a kind of oval slit. Let me show you just so I can sh sure. give an example. I'm going to pull up a slide here from the piercing of the side. Let's see. Right. This is important to show that he dies on the cross, right? Because you can't have a resurrection if you didn't have a death before. So it's really important. Like some of our Muslim friends will say, mm -hmm. Jesus was nursed back to health. He, mm -hmm. he was brought to the brink of, of death perhaps, but he didn't actually die. Look at slide uh, 44. It shows a Roman lancea that pierces the right side of the chest, mm -hmm. right between the fifth and sixth rib, a distance of about 10 centimeters or 3.5 inches to the heart. And so it's going to penetrate the, the pleura and then all the way to the heart such that outflows blood and water. Remember mm -hmm. that detail in John's gospel and an eyewitness has testified and he knows his testimony is true, outflows blood and water. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a detail that um, shows up on the, on the shroud. But, but look at this next slide quick. 45 is the dying Gaul. This is from the third century BC. And this soldier has been struck in between the fifth and sixth rib wow. on the right side of the you chest that photo there? in the exact same uh, position statue yeah yeah so this statue you can see it is on capitoline hill in rome and he's contemplating his own death he knows that it's coming just moments away wow and he's so Roman so is soldiers, he examining what's coming out of him or is that the point of him looking down like that or is well, it just him collapsing? I'm not sure. I, th I think it might, uh, the dying Gaul, I think it's him preparing for death. But what I find fascinating is that we know that the weaponry existed and that the strategy was employed so that when you'd have the Roman lancea, you would jab with your left hand. Your sword might have been in your right hand, but apparently with the long spear, you want a distance and you're trained to strike the heart. And so when you do so, if you're using your left hand, it's very likely that you strike the right side of the victim. Yeah. And that's what we see in the dying gall, and it's what we see on the shroud. And there's not a great angle. I know in some like Zeffirelli movies, like Jesus is like 30 feet in the air or something. It's not the case. It's enough that you're six inches off the ground as long as you can't stand up, right? Yeah. And so it's, it's, he's actually like right in front of us. Is that right? And, and so that the, uh, the angle is relatively flat or relatively, it's not like he's reaching up ah. high in the sky. Um, and so uh, a double-edged blade leads this kind of blood stain. Look at number 46. Um, and you can see a, uh, that black dot is like the hole that where the spear go, goes in. And then look how there's, it's like pressurized blood that spurts out, leaving these empty spaces um, because of the pressure now you have to imagine so he's already been dead which means that the heart is not pumping anymore which means that the denser portions of the blood are settling to the base of the heart so the heart is like the size of a clenched fist mm -hmm. so if you pierce that through what's going to flow out first is going to be corpulous blood which is red but then outflows serous blood that is plasma and so if there's separated blood it means that he's been dead for at least 30 to 60 minutes because that's how long it takes once the heart stops for now the blood to settle and separate so this isn't this isn't blood that was shed during life it's post-mortem mm. blood which is exactly what the scriptures recount and, and of course they do so in terms that are super simple outflow of blood and water um, but it corresponds to what we see of course we couldn't see it with the naked eye in 1978 though remember these guys that from the stirp project they're not looking with the naked eye. It's all because you can't see water. You can see the blood just fine. But if you shine UV and capture what fluoresces, there's like a halo around this blood stain. Um, so that's the very next slide. 47 shows that, of course, I've only I can't show you UV because it's <laughs> ultravioleta, right? It's ultraviolet. But what 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 is here is that there's evidence of a around the outline, mm -hmm. evidence of of serum. So this is the kind of level of detail that I'm saying that we're on. Have you ever looked at a picture for, of a, the circular system as depicted in the 1200s? It's laughable. Like we just didn't know the intricate musculature that surrounds an artery as opposed to a vein or how vein uh, venous blood flows out of the frontal vein as opposed to the arterial blood mm. at the side. These are the kinds of things that I'm saying are, are anatomically perfect. I see. Uh, we have a skeptical question here. Um, 
Why does the carbon dating accidentally correspond to the very narrow window of time in history where the shroud first appeared in written history? If it's supposed to be some accident, well, because even, oh, even if well, let's sorry, yeah. I thought that was a follow up question. Yeah, you go for because it. there's an intelli intelligible, plausible hypothesis that explains that, namely that there is first century material blended with 16th century material, such that you have a gradient go moving left to right, such that you have uh, it, the theory is that. The one to the far left has more first century material and less 16th century material. As you move to the right, you get more 16th century material such that you go something like 1240 to then 1300, 1340 and 1440. Okay, so there's a plausible explanation for that. But look, I want to say even if you don't accept the theory of French invisible weave, which seems to be, to my mind, I think it's the best thing on the tip. That's my personal opinion. I'm happy to call it an opinion. We've not proved French invisible weave. We got plenty of good evidence for it. The, the Los Alamos uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory that inherited Ray Rogers' um, splice showed how it was indeed a splice, showed how at the intersections of the threads, if you remove them, there's a white strand. Why? Because there's a plant gum that's soaked into the fibers left and right of the intersection, but where there's... Uh, where there's crossing over, they're unable to see uh, how the, the the plant gum didn't penetrate into that which is covered, which makes perfect sense. So in other words, we're introducing new organic material that makes sense of the 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 data that's there. So I think that it's there's there's simply and moreover, it cor it corresponds to exactly what we knew from ten years prior that that upper left corner is heterogeneous. Uh, with regard to its chemical composition. So th that, that's just, that simply points to that that's an anomalous portion of the shroud. Well, that's exactly what we know about that portion of the shroud. So it's, 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 it's perfectly plausible. If he wants to say, is it some coincidence that it's from 1260 and then we have a paper trail that points back to 1354? Look, I want to ask him about 1192. I want to ask him about the Hungarian Pro Prey Codex. Everybody understands that this is the shroud. So check this out. This is slide 57. This is a prey codex that dates precisely to the years 1192 to 1195. And we know that because not slide 57, I slide think. 57. Yeah, that's it. Um, so this prey codex, um, as the name suggests, uh, contains prayers, contains musical notation. And so we're able to date it very precisely to that, to those years. But it's a cartoon. It's like a comic strip from the 12th century, which I think is amazing. So can you see the top scene here where yeah. the, these men with beards are anointing uh, the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. And we know it's the body of Christ because, see, his halo has mm -hmm. the cross in it. Um, these two guys have beards. I guess this guy doesn't have a beard. That must be John, I guess, on the far right. Um, but the detail that counts for the shroud is that you see how the body's on top of this long yeah. linen? And then there's further details, specifically the hands. Mm. So... Most of us have five fingers, I'm pretty sure, and yet this guy has four. Hmm. And on the shroud, guess what? You can't see the thumbs. No way. And the reason Get so out. is so clearly the thumbs are underneath sure. the index fingers. Sure. Um, and some have suggested that it's because that the nails penetrate through these nerves. I see. And that the, the knee jerk. Collapses yeah, your hand. Exactly. As a, as a reef. Be that as it may, you can't see the thumbs on the shroud and neither on the Hungarian prey codex. But that's not even the best part. If you go down to scene two, you're gonna see that these women who are carrying their flasks ready to anoint a body that isn't there are surprised by the angel who says, you know, pointing his finger, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not here, he's been raised. And so you have instead that cloth one more time. That same cloth that you saw in scene one, it's now portrayed once again on the lower portion of that uh, the, uh, the picture, but this time we get further details that show the weave, and the weave is the is exactly the pattern that we see uh -oh. on the shroud, the, it was called a herringbone weave. Uh, this is achieved on the loom by going over three and then under one thread, over three and under one. It's called a three to one. Okay herringbone weave. And so we get these, um, it kind of looks like a pyramid on the left. I've zoomed in to show you, see how there's like diagonal lines that go up and then they yep. go down into yep. the right. So it looks kind of like if, if you're a little creative, like the spinal cord of a fish, and that's why it gets this name herringbone weave, but that's not all. It's, I just, it's the, again, the convergence of all but these there's elements. More. There's more. So just look up above and you see in the shape of like a seven, four holes, mm -hmm. they've been called, it's a misnomer, but we call them the poker holes mm -hmm. as if somebody took a 
yeah. a hot poker, it's more likely that something like charcoal fell on them, maybe in a right of who knows. But in any case, the, it's fire. It's the reduce. Uh, it's the 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 effect of of heat on the shroud, and it left these holes in the shape of an a seven, and then in the shape of an L, depending on which way you're looking. Right here, about three quarters down to the right, and they're here on the shroud in exactly. I'll point them out on this uh, black and white um, mm -hmm. zoomed in version. Uh, it looks like one, two, three, four holes there and then yeah. again on wow. the far one two three four in the shape of a, a seven and so um <laughs> nobody so, doubts yeah, okay. nobody doubts that this hungarian prague goddess is referencing the shroud of turin and keep in mind it's in 1192 wow. that's 70 years prior the oldest date that the that was allowed by the 1988 carbon dating and so someone said uh it's off but it's 80 years yeah, first of all you told me you were 95 percent sure and you and you're wrong clearly but then there's no like, hey, let me explain this uh, this shroud to you. It's simply taking for granted that you know what this is. It's like how how long must it have been in existence to just kind of nonchalantly like present this image without any need of explanation? It's not coming out of nowhere. In other words, there's centuries of devotion that precede it. Also, the, the very idea of poker holes means that there was some instance of veneration, most likely for the shroud, such that there was that that this um, this harm to the shroud came came to be. So that's at least one good question that ought to be raised when someone comes from that angle. But then I I, I want to say, bring in the okay, explain to me the sudarium. Explain to me that 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 this these anomalous, very amorphous shapes, blood scene that coincide um explain to me that the blood has these these unique qualities that it shows that a man that has lung edema that, that we have these um icons down through the centuries what about the coins what about the veneration and this, we should talk about the history huh because we didn't we didn't do this but this is like shroud abcs a little bit where was the shroud and when okay so we know it ended up in turin but where did it start in jerusalem in the year 33 a.d Jesus, or thereabouts, that Jesus has died and laid in the tomb. According to a legend of uh, Abgar, there's a king in Edessa who hears about Jesus, this uh, miracle worker down south, and because of his leprosy, he says, I wish he could come to me. I guess it's Thaddeus Jude who proposes the next thing, next best thing, because he goes north with the shroud, mm. and when Abgar venerates this face, he's healed of his leprosy and converted to Christianity. And so there's a pocket of Christians there in Edessa, um, but that is reversed as soon as Abgar's son takes the throne, um, reverts to paganism, and starts persecuting the Christians who go into hiding along with the shroud, which is buried in the city walls. And so it's not until there's a flood in 525 that they now need to reconstruct those city walls. And they find the shroud, they rediscover it in 544. Now granted, at this time, it's not called the Shroud of Turin. It's gonna go by other names, obviously. Uh, the question is, does it correspond to what today is called the Shroud of Turin? And it seems that that's the case. What was it called? Mandilion is one of the names. We have other images, image of Edessa. And so what the historian needs to do is look at these different documents and say, okay, this is what we know about this cloth. Mm -hmm. um, does it correspond? Mm -hmm. Could it be the Shroud? Are there good reasons to, to say so? And some will say yes, and some will say no. And there's, there's, there's room for the debate, for sure. Yeah, that's con the controverted history, but I, it's good to know at least the pegs that people are pointing to. So after 544, um, it stays uh, until 944 in Edessa, but that's when Romanus I, who's the emperor in Constantinople, wants to bring together all of the relics of Christ's passion into his house, basically, under, under his roof. And so there it goes and stays for almost three centuries, but in 1204, there's the Fourth Crusade, and so you have crusaders from Europe that basically sack and pillage uh, in Constantinople and take home a little souvenir uh, the, the, the shroud. And so this is what's called the open years between 1204, the fourth crusade um, and 1354. Where was the shroud? We don't know. But when, when it does pop up, lo and behold, it's in the hands of those who have ties to the Knights Templar. Mm. Again, not everybody is on the same page about the 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 crusaders and their connection with the shroud but this is one of those theories and so i think it's uh what's the guy's name that i like is a is it jack mark i'm gonna get his name wrong maybe you could look this up but um mark i want to say markwort 
or something like that. Um, it has a book and you could, I think, enumerate something like 15 or 20, maybe more theories about what occurred during the mm. missing years, 1204 to 1354. But So it's for those at home, just to kind of sum this up, it's yeah. not as if we have the shroud being spoken about in the Bible and then the next time we hear about it is in the 13th century. Exactly. It's it's something that dates back. What's post-biblical? When do we first hear about? Well, I think the Abgar legend yeah. is the earliest. Which is um, well, I mean, well, it, that would date what's I think pertinent to say is that it's one of the 12 that is moving the shroud. So I don't know when we okay. can date the legend because, but may, I'm sure, yeah, that's something that people could look up. The, yeah. the hidden history of the shroud of Turin by Jack Mark Ward. Mark Ward. Yeah, exactly. So M A R K W A R D T. Right. So I've, I've not actually read his full book. I heard him speak in an international Congress one time and I just thought it was fascinating. Like this guy in a matter of short, a matter of few minutes presented 15 theories of the missing years. And apparently there are more. And so, and I'm open to that. Like this is what historians do. This is what scientists do. They propose theories, they fish for data and let the mess, be, mess best man win kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Right. So let's let's put it on the table let's get it all out i know ian wilson is one who wrote a book that got a lot of play but i also know that he's not followed up to kind of um respond to criticisms and so some have called into question his theory and so that's fine you know let the let that debate take place and i'll let the historians do that dr shower white is someone in who teaches in louisiana and uh, has been to archives in italy we've we traveled together to chambéry and to lire and to uh, or not to lire but to chambéry and to um to turin and so I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll find more manuscripts more attestation but um, what we have, I think, is enough to take seriously, at the very least, the shroud. It's like, um, especially things like the soil. I, I find, that one really gets me. It's like, what are we going to do with that? That this travertine aragonite, the, the calcium carbonate with just the, the strontium that we know is matches the grottos of Jerusalem. Pollen, that's another one that gets people big time. I mean, what we'd really need is like pollen ingrained in the blood stain. Pollen that, because so we have some 113, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, what's it called? Uh, Turneforzi or something like that. There's a plant. I'm trying to remember its Latin name, but it's a. Uh, oh, it's escaping me right now. But uh, Gludia. It's like Gludia Turneforzi or something like that. Um, but 113 that were identified there. So there was Max Fry was a criminologist, a Swiss criminologist who does like sticky tape samples, mm -hmm. puts them under a microscope to identify like what species of plant. And we're not talking like one or two, but again, over a hundred of the same that blossom in May, April and May right there in, in and around Jerusalem. So I think stuff like that is, it needs accounting for. Yeah. Uh, you already, did you want to keep going? No. Um, are there any confirmed miracles associated with the shroud? Yeah. Many people have asked me about that or, or, or. You mentioned one already with the leprosy, but. Right. Yeah. So that, that was, that was one that goes way back and some have called that a legend. And even if it is, even if there are legendary aspects to it, it may have a historical base, even if we're unsure to, like how far does the historical basic extend? I understand if people want to call that into question, like, um, was there truly a miraculous healing of his leprosy? Like, I don't know. I, but that's what, that's what was passed down for sure. Um, what I will say is this, that it's not to be underestimated. You know, when, when Jesus talks about um, throwing a, a mountain into the sea or let this mulberry tree be uprooted, you know, for those who have faith. I don't know about you. I've not thrown any uh, mountains into the sea lately. I've not. And yet I know that God moves mountains. And for me, the biggest mountain, more impressive than Mount Everest itself, is when he moves the human heart from disbelief into belief. Mm -hmm. And that's where mm -hmm. I think the shroud is most yeah. powerful that many people, and I've seen it in my, in the flesh, right? I'll tell you a story, one in particular. So there was a group that came from Spain. It was a girl's school. This girl was a senior. I want to say she's 17, 18 years old. And she was known for being that gadfly in class that would ask the, you know, the consecrated that women. That was me. I, <laughs> yeah. was, I was the gadfly when I was 17. <laughs> you know, all these annoying questions like, you know, what about this? Oh, and what about yeah. that? And the skeptic mm -hmm. and for this and that. So she comes to Rome and she, we, we do a shroud tour along with her class. And the next day, the consecrated women ask her, you know, there's all these priests with all their degrees, you know, why don't you ask them your tough questions? And she said, you know what? After yesterday's talk at the shroud, I don't think I need to. Mm. And, and so she was, this was the kind of discourse she evidently needed to hear. And that yeah. helped her. And 
So you never know what you're removing. I am always so impressed with the kinds of questions that I get. So sometimes I'll lead, I'll lead young people through our exhibition on the shroud and then just take follow-up questions. Yeah. And I've done this with uh, medical doctors, with bishops, with nuns, with uh, first communion or confirmation classes. It is amazing the questions that come. Sometimes they have nothing to do with the shroud. It's like, I thought it was just giving like a scientific discourse or a historical one. And they'll come back and be like, well, what about prayers to the saints? And what about purgatory? <laughs> and you realize that they're, the, the gears are turning upstairs yeah, and they're yeah. realizing immediately like, whoa, this is real. Jesus is risen from the dead. So help sort what out they, these other issues I have. Yeah, so, so heard. exactly. We just removed a major boulder that was an obstacle. <laughs> yep. And now what does this mean? What is it? Wait, but there's this other obstacle. And so that comes surging to the surface. And so I think there's, that's the, the surreal tool of evangelization that we have here. It awakens something in people. It's a kind of discourse we've not heard. The, the, the reason the number one reason our young people are saying they can't believe is science. And so give them science, right? And what they're going to see is that it's not only compatible, but faith and science are mutually illuminating. And so, but they need to see one case study, like probe all the science that's here. And what you're going to see is that it is intelligible. And, and, and yet it brings us to considerations of Christ's uh, death and resurrection. And now we're talking about the core of our Christian faith. And this is why when I, when I tour, I um, tour, I don't like that word, but when I'm invited to speak in, in a parish or I've even done this in, in one time, my favorite spot was Hong Kong on the mm -hmm. 29th floor of like JP Morgan. I think there was like one Catholic in the crowd, but the rest were non, some were, some Protestants, but it was like chic and uh, Buddhist and just non-believers but they were, they were mesmerized by just the sheer science of it, like explain this mystery to me. And I was like, where else do I get the chance to talk about Jesus and the core mysteries of our faith, the incarnation and the resurrection, which mm -hmm. points to his divinity, like the divinity of Christ and his incarnation. This is, this is like everything. And we're able to talk at length. It's like, I can't talk a homily past seven minutes without getting tomatoes thrown at me, but we can go, what, two, three hours easy. On the, on the shroud and, and the questions come, who is this man? Why did he suffer? What does it mean? And I, I think that's, that needs to be played up a whole lot more if we take seriously the work of evangelization. Jay Latta says, oftentimes Jesus is portrayed on the cross with a loincloth, Oof. but is that historically accurate? Can we, <laughs> any evidence of a loincloth or otherwise in the shroud? No, none whatsoever. In fact, it's just the opposite, that in the moment of scourging, we know him to be naked because the wounds that are in the uh, pelvic region are just as deep as everywhere else in the body. So there was no loincloth and that's on purpose, mm. right? They're putting you on display. They're, they're going to the crossroads just outside the city gate where plenty of people would see you and you'd be humiliated. And so that's the whole point. Now, I want to be careful here. I know that because this is the kind of thing that I hate to say and I hate to not say at the same time, because I think that um, you you don't want to if Jesus suffered it, it's for a reason. Like Jesus is stepping into these sufferings. It, it occurs to me to say that um, Pope St. John Paul II in his uh, Theology of the Body, um, there's a whole chapter on the original nakedness, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be thought about, pondered more deeply. I don't pretend to have the best answer or the definitive answer, um, but the fact that Jesus is naked is, I think, for obvious reasons, we put a loincloth in our churches, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't think that needs any explanation. <laughs> but if it's true that he was naked in the moment of scourging, and I can't imagine that those who are doing these kinds of uh, tortures are concerned to give it back to him once he's put to the cross. Um, so it is possible, though, by the way, to answer Jay's question. Um, it, could, it could be that after the fact they put on that loincloth, but we have no evidence of that. Um, and so, but what is the, I think the deeper question is, what is the meaning that he was naked? Mm -hmm. And I think what's happening here is that Jesus is shown to be a new Adam. And he's, suff he's stepping into the knot that Adam and Eve tied with their disobedience. Mm -hmm. And from that place, with his loving obedience to the Father, is pouring out the love that unties the knot. But he's not from a distance saying like, hey, I'll suffer a little you know, paper cut and then just say by fiat or so by some decree or something, some type of penal substitution or juridical de declaration that atones us by some just a moral imputation or something. It is not the case. He's taking the full effects of our sin yeah. and on upon himself 
the way I like to say, I'm glad, can I expand on the answer Please. here a little bit? Because this, it goes into the crown of thorns, but I think it's what, uh, I, I, I just get a lot of light out of it. And I think it does speak to the question in a way. Okay. So at the foot of the cross, people are shouting at the Pharisees are saying, if you are the Christ and the son of God, show it, come down and we'll believe in you. Which is like, hey, that's a good deal, Jesus. Like, you've got your chance. Why not? But this is where I want to point to the crown of thorns and see, like, if you look with the eyes of the scientist, you'll see something, but it's a bit shallow. You'll see something like, okay, those thorns were three quarters of an inch long. They penetrate every area, every area of the surface of the skin. They penetrate through the skin into the bony plate, et cetera, et cetera. But that's like, I could sum that up by saying, ouch. Like, okay, it hurt. It's a lot of pain. It's ugly. But what does it mean, right? And this is where you got to go to the scripture and you'll get much more insight. The first time thorns appear in the scripture are in Genesis 3, right after the fall. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of fruit trees good for eating in Genesis 1 and 2. There are no thorns, but after they eat of the forbidden fruit, the Lord God appears to Adam and says, because you have listened to your wife and eaten of the fruit of which I said, thou shall not eat of it. Cursed be the ground because of you. So just pause there to note that this is a cosmic curse as an effect of man's sin. And the curse takes a very particular shape because the Lord God goes on to say, thorns and thistles shall shall it bear for you. The, the ground will mm-hmm. come and by the sweat of your brow shall you have bread to eat, etc. Right? But I find that fascinating. The, the fallout of the fall, the consequence of the original sin is a curse that takes a very particular shape, thorns, or to be more, more precise, thorns and thistles, which is the exact vocabulary, by the way, that reappears in the first sermon of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, where he says, beware of um, false prophets. They are like ravenous wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. And the apostles are like, well, great, Jesus, how am I going to pick them out in the crowd? They look just like the rest. And he says, you'll know them by their fruit. Are thorns, are grapes mm. gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? <laughs> thorns and thistles. It's the exact same vocabulary and in the exact same context. In other words, he's not talking about re- uh, agriculture with grapes and figs. He's, it's a metaphor for moral evil. Uh, thorns and thistles, the chaos and the the disobedience, the the sin is mm-hmm. cast in these terms. Put two and two together and what do you get? That Jesus knew that according to the biblical motif, thorns stood for sin, just that he would he knew that he would be crowned with thorns. And so I think that without even opening his mouth, but simply by wearing the crown, mm-hmm. what he's communicating to all standing by is, I'm the sin bearer. I bear the sins of the world, which is exactly the reading you would get if you understood from the Old Testament too, that it's the high priest that would communicate the sins of the people by putting his hands on the head of the scapegoat, not just anywhere, but on the head. And now this this goat would go mm-hmm. out into the wilderness to die. So it was a liturgical rep- representation of of this transfer of our sins to him. Mm -hmm. He's cast out. Jesus is outside the city gate, according to Hebrews and they're put to death. So it's, it's coming together, isn't it? The thorns, there's one expression from the Psalm that says, let one's evil return upon his head. So when what goes around comes around and when it comes around, where does it land on your head? So the, of course, Jesus, according to Isaiah, he is the suffering servant, but we laid on him Mm -hmm. the, the sins of us all. (laughs) <laughs> by his stripes, we were healed. So there is a kind of exchange here, but Jesus is that vicarious victim who in our stead um, takes the, the the curse that is according to our punishment. This is where Genesis 22 comes into play because there you have Isaac who is led up a mountain. On the third day, Abraham is told which mountain it is, Mount Moriah. There he's, he's given a test of God and he's to offer his only son, uh, his beloved son, Isaac, as a holocaust, as a whole burnt offering. And they get there, and there they are. The only beloved son is carrying the wood of the cross up the mountain, um, which, by the way, begs the question, how old was Isaac? Certainly he's not four years old if he's carrying the wood mm-hmm. for the sacrifice. According to the rabbinic tradition, he's 30 <laughs> years old or thereabouts. Mm. This is fascinating because you know the rest of the story. In the moment that the knife would fall and Abraham would offer 
as a Holocaust, his only beloved son, the angel stays his hand and says, now that I know that you fear God, do no harm to the boy. Abraham wheels around to see mm-hmm. a ram, not a lamb, even though that was the question that was asked. Up the mountain, Abraham there's is like, okay, son, here we go. Dad, here's the wood for the sacrifice. Where's the lamb? And Abraham says right there in the passage, God will provide the lamb. And yet he doesn't, not on that day, because the moment the angel appears, Abraham spins around to find a ram. But this is the detail that's so often missed. With its horns caught Caught in in a a thicket, thicket, its head, the head of this vicarious victim, is wrapped in thorn, and it will be sacrificed as the beloved son is spared. That's the exact language now that reappears in Romans, by the way. Paul thought of this too, in other words. That's not the... So... Also, real quick, I want to ask, if he was 30, Abraham had to have been like 120. Yeah. Which means at a certain point, Isaac was not being over... Like, Isaac could... Abraham couldn't have overpowered Isaac, right? Like, at a certain point, Isaac was laying his life down. Well, that's exactly what the rabbinic tradition says. The Akedah, this passage, Genesis 22, is called the Akedah, the binding, the binding of Isaac. But... Yeah. They say that, uh, and, and you can read Targums about this, that he was a willing victim, that he and must have been. So he was, he was strong, as you say. He was, uh, Abraham was feeble and, and old. How is it that he, if he wasn't a willing victim, how did he get bound in the first place? Of course, this is to move beyond the sure. biblical text. So I want to say that too. But it is fascinating to think that Jews to this day understand that uh, Isaac was a willing victim. Um, but that's not the end of the passage. Um, the end of the passage, if you read down to the down the page, is when they rename this mountain and they rename it Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. That's sometimes not ca- caught in uh, context or in translation, but the Lord will provide what? Read up just a few verses, mm-hmm. and it was clear God will provide a lamb, but He didn't, which is exactly why it left room for John the Baptist in page one of John's Gospel to say. Behold the Lamb of God. He goes on to say, who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. Okay, so now fast forward to Good Friday, where you have this Lamb of God on a tree and the, and with the crown of thorns, uh, suggesting that he's rhyming typologically, mm-hmm. both with Genesis 3 in one way and in Genesis 22 in another, as they're saying, come down and we'll believe you. That's exactly like saying, you've got divine muscle, flex, right? You got the power, show it. You know, one of the words for power is horn. We use this expression in often, like like the horn of our salvation uh, means a mighty savior in translation. So horn is a metaphor for, um, for power in the Old Testament. So remember, it's the horns that are wrapped in a thicket there in Genesis 22. So to Jesus' horns, metaphorically speaking, of course, are wrapped in a thicket. That is to say, Mm. you want to see power, guys, if that's what you're asking for, I'll show you power. I'll die and on the third day rise, but for the time being, my horns are wrapped in a thicket. By the way, that imagery is easily understood if you just consider like a ram, when he attacks, he charges with his horns. If you want to defend yourself, you charge right back. Mm -hmm. And is that the way Jesus battles Satan? It's like, you take a blow, I'll punch back harder. No, of course not. Jesus is God. Satan is his creature. There is no way the darkness can battle the light. I think that's the appropriate metaphor. All Mm -hmm. of the, all, it's like Jesus is saying, empty your fury on me. Spend all your strength on me, Satan. Um, Concentrate on one point, all of your fury, and I will take it upon myself. I will drink that cup. But when, know this, like when you bury me in the, in the land of the dead, and I come right, and light comes shining out of the darkness, know this, that the battle has been definitively won. Jesus is the victor. This is Christus Victor theology, that Jesus concentrates upon himself all the consequences of sin. He bears it in his body and then rises victorious such that we are victorious to the extent that we are in Christ. So that's our only wish is to be in him Mm -hmm. so that we can participate in his glory. But what he's doing on the cross, and this is what I think is so fascinating. This is why we need the scriptures. Because if I were to look with the eyes of a scientist, all I could see is a man being executed Okay, with with uh, crowns that are yay long, a, a, a crown of thorns mm-hmm. that are so long. But what I think he's saying more deeply is that I'm revealing myself to be 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who opens up paradise, who ga- who gains access. It's like Jesus is facing those fiery um, f- swords of those cherubim, gaining access back into Eden. And this mm-hmm. is a new exodus, right? And But we're not led back into the land of milk and honey. We're going to the Trinity. That's where this ends as mm-hmm. Jesus ascends to the Father and uh, sits at the right hand in glory. That's the new exodus. That's his end point. That's what's been wrenched open, right? If you remember, the exodus ends ended the first exodus when they crossed the jordan and that was parted mm-hmm. right a jordan river yeah when jesus is baptized what is rent omen according to mark chapter one what is schizoed torn open mm-hmm. the heavens such that the voice of the father comes spilling out and so does the holy spirit in the form of a dove as if to say the trinity the life of the trinity the life of god himself that's the paradise that we're going back into But now, of course, Jesus, when he dies, what does every evangelist highlight in the very next sentence? He breathes his last period. The curtain of the temple is torn. That's the cosmic inclusio between Mark 1 and what is it, Mark 15 or 16? 15, I suppose. But um, as if to say, I am gaining access into new holy of holies. And if you're with me, you share in it too. And so, gosh, it's the theology that I want to get into. I'm, uh, I lament a little bit that so much of Shroud studies mm. has been uh, super saturated with scientific yeah. uh, theology. Oh, and, and that's good. I want the science too, but it's a both end. It's not an either or. We need to have really hang on to both end together to put them into dialogue. Yeah, I, I almost feel bad having to ask questions less lofty than what you're, what you're <laughs> answering. I'm so grateful for that. That was beautiful. Um, Frankie Mercado just gave us a super chat. He said, hi, Father Andrew. I am a science undergraduate student at the University of Notre, Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Is there any way that I can intern under you for the <laughs> summer and study the newest research on this? Because this stuff is so cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, please sign up for the postgraduate certificate. We have I, I wish we had hundreds of people subscribing every year, but we don't. We have like a couple dozen. And I just think there's so much more to be done. Yeah. I, I am not a scientist. Like I, okay, I did two years at Georgia Tech and then I began studying, you know, humanities and Latin and literature and philosophy and theology. So I, you know, I, I dabble into the science. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint there, but I am not an expert. I quote the experts when I can, you know, if I know that it's this physicist or that, I'll try to cite my sources so that people can look into it for themselves. But quite honestly, we need scientists also with a faith perspective that can go into the different areas and, you know, give their expertise to what is an ongoing uh, study. So, I think a good starting point would be, uh, for those who are more serious, um, you can sign, it's it's super cheap by the way, like I'm embarrassed at how cheap it is for one year to get access to these videos from these leading experts from all over the all, all over the world. But look, I'm not, we're, we're not trying to make money off the thing with the idea is that you go out and spread the good news about this. So get it, get the postgraduate certificate videos, learn from the scientists themselves, and then, um, and then dive deep into shroud.com because what you're going to find is like if you want to specialize in things like the blood you really need to go into all the literature on that if you want to study think something like art history that's a complete different corpus of literature and so you, mm. but and so get your starting get your bearings get like yeah it'll give you a, a holistic holistic point of view yep. and then dive deep um, we have another skeptical question. Good. You may have responded, but feel free to take another swipe at it. He says, there were three laboratories with three different samples that conducted tests on the shroud and all converged within the same range, 1,200 to 1,300. Mm-hmm. Are we to believe all three labs received samples from the same top left patch that was known to newer known to n- newer compared to the rest? Known to of, be newer. Oh, okay. Com- known when to compared... Perhaps, Perhaps that's what he meant. Was you, known to be newer. Full com- sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. Are we to believe that <laughs> all three labs received samples from the same top left patch that was known to be newer compared to the rest of the shroud? Yes, we do know that. No, that's, there's no <laughs> doubt that we know that. <laughs> yes, we, yes, next question. That's, that's the answer. And we have it on videotape. We know where they cut the sample. Well, they cut eight centimeters. They kept four centimeters on reserve. Those four centimeters were diced up and given to Arizona 1, mm-hmm. Ari- then Oxford and Zurich, and then Arizona 2. Four centimeters were then sent, the, those four different samples were sent to the individual laboratories and they gave their individual re- results, um, but they did so when they published collectively. Mm-hmm. And then, so they have, we have on reserve that other four, that other four centimeters. So the patch that was sampled, we know exactly where it was taken from. We know it to be 
uh, heterogeneous with respect to the rest of the shroud. That's that's what I would want to say. All right. Well, look, we've I think we've gone over three hours now. So you have anything else you want to add? Gosh, what would I want to end with all of this? I suppose that um, I think it needs to be highlighted that when we look to the face of Christ, we contemplate him in his death. But if it's the case that it's the resurrection that made this image, we're also aware that the body that is so bruised and battered, that face which is so disfigured, is also about to rise. And in this instant, rising. And so those eyes are going to open. And that's our destiny too face-to-face vision of our Lord. That's what we long for as Christians. Now we're in this you know, valley of tears, in this land of exile, and we await face-to-face vision. We need the help of this image, I believe, to contemplate his face and to long to see him alive because that's what we're made for. Like Augustine says, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Mm-hmm. No matter what the world can offer, it can't offer anything like this, what Christ has to, uh, in in our inheritance is his because we're co-heirs with him so long as we believe. And so that's the invitation I would give. And look, I'm happy for the skeptics to come. I want like uh, Jesus with uh, St. Thomas, the skeptic to say, come press and probe, put your, put your hand, Thomas in my side, press and probe. Hey, you scientists come with your microscopes and all your x-ray and infrared and all the rest study the shroud. But don't be unbelieving, but believe. Mm. In other words, that's the invitation to this encounter with Christ to see him with eyes of faith, because that's where we'll meet him. Final question, <laughs> three plus hours in, what is your personal opinion of what created that image? So I think that the shroud is the natural effect of a supernatural event. It's my personal opinion that the miracle isn't so much the shroud, although I know some people use that language. I much prefer to say that I think the miracle is the resurrection when that corpse became a living, glorified, divinized body. That and there was what, something about and that. And that's that, whatever light effects might have accompanied such an event, which I don't pretend to be able to uh, describe or much less reproduce artificially. Um, but if somebody does want to volunteer to die and rise again, let me know. I'll hook you up with some physicists. We can do some comparative analysis. Um, but... Well, that's what I think. I think that in the moment of the resurrection, um, you know, there's even some verses in Hebrews that use some luminous, like in a flash of light. Obviously, it's metaphorical language, but it could could it be the case? Like, look, we get all kinds of luminous imagery in the transfiguration, don't we? Like, you know, when Jesus mm. is up on the mountain mm-hmm. and his face is radiant dazzling like the white. sun, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or in his dazzling white in Luke's words, exactly. And, and so wh- what I love about that is that the glory of his divine person was shining through his humanity. It didn't eclipse it. It didn't uh, destroy his humanity, but it did perfect it. And that's what I think awaits us too, is that God is by his grace. He's going to make us what he is. That's why he became what we are, right? To use the the words Mm -hmm. of our first um, theologians to describe how soteriology works. There's a divine exchange by which he he was immortal takes on our mortal nature so that in our nature he can heal it and what he didn't assume he didn't heal so he assumed our full nature and he showed it to be the case most radically in his death but then when he rises he shows his divine person and that's what we're contemplating every scene of the gospel by the way is that there's a divine person who is operating behind whatever human actions you might be seeing you know healing a leper or walking on water or calming the storm it's like a divine person is doing those deeds, is forgiving those sins, and we contemplate his presence here because that's the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. There's a translation in human language that doesn't diminish in the least his divine presence. It manifests it. Mm-hmm. Our, the, our cosmos awaits uh, the new day when we too, are, when all the cosmos is reborn, is regenerated. Of course, we await the parousia, but it's, it's already here in one sense. He's inaugurated because in his person, in Christ the head, he has reached consummate glory mm. on the, in the church. That glory is inaugurated, but not consummated. And so we wait that day. Amen. Amen. And whoever that person was who was unbelieving and prayed that prayer of acceptance to Christ, let us know who you are so we can pin that comment to the top <laughs> of the uh, top to the top of the comment section. And Thank invite you. prayers for that person, right? Exactly. Y- yeah. <laughs> Thank you kindly for being on. This has been outstanding. I'm so grateful that you've dedicated this much attention to this this topic, so that you can help us. So yeah, thank you, Father. Thank you, Thursday.
Do you want to mention one more time your uh, upcoming podcast? Oh, yeah, one more time. One Can't more hurt. Time. Yeah, so come check us out at the two priests. Those two priests. Those, I guess two, priests. Priests. <laughs> Those two priests. Link in yeah, the description. In the description. Go check it out. Yeah, I, I can't wait to be a subscriber. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> All right. So. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory forever.